Bell Science Symposium. Good morning to our West Coast colleagues and good afternoon or evening to those of you joining us from elsewhere. Before we get started right at half past the hour, we have just a few housekeeping notes to cover. So first of all, we'd love to know who's here with us today, joining us uh, for day two. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat window, share your name, affiliation, what you're excited to learn about today. If you were on the call yesterday, let us know your favorite part about yesterday's program. Be sure that you are sending your chat to all panelists and attendees. Select that option from the drop down menu in the chat. Again, we will get started at half past the hour. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat window as you join us. As we continue our introductions, just a couple more notes before we get started. We will be saving time at the end of each presentation for a brief live Q&A session. So if you do have questions for presenters, please ask them in the Q&A panel, not the chat. That way we can keep track of questions. Be sure to include the speaker's name at the beginning of your question so we know to who we should direct it to. Again, type your question in the Q&A panel and be sure to hit send. If you're joining us on YouTube, we will be taking questions from YouTube too. Just use the YouTube live chat and be sure to mark who your question is for. If you are having any connectivity issues, there are a couple of options. The first is to leave Zoom and join on the YouTube live stream. Again, you can join from the upper right corner of your Zoom window to view stream on custom live streaming service or you can split your audio and video bandwidth by calling in from your phone for better audio. That is from the, your audio settings in your lower left Zoom window corner. Here's a brief overview of today's agenda. We'll have some introductory remarks followed by presentations and concluding with a panel discussion with our presenters. We do hope you can stay for the entire program, but if you do have to step away, we will be posting a full recording of the event on our YouTube and on the event webpage after the event. And as a reminder, today is day two of the Cell Science Symposium. If you were unable to join us for day one, the webinar is available on our YouTube channel or the event webpage on alleninstitute.org. We are now at half past the hour, so I am happy to introduce Graham Johnson, Senior Director of the Animated Cell Team at the Allen Institute for Cell Science to give opening remarks. Welcome, Graham. Thank you, Megan. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Uh, good morning and welcome to the second and final day of the 2022 Seattle Cell Science Symposium. My name is Graham Johnson and I'm one of the directors here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. In case you missed the first day of the symposium, a recording of the talks and the panel discussions is available on YouTube. I've highlighted the link. Uh, you can get to it from a button on our website at allencell.org in the flashing green down there. I'm eager to get to the main event because I think you're, you're in for a real treat with the itinerary of talent we have lined up. But as a way of introducing these speakers and relating their presentations to some of the work we do here at the Institute, I want to briefly describe our mission, science, and some of the resources we make available while we work with the community towards this goal of data integration from multiomics to imaging. In an attempt to keep you on the edge of your seats towards the end of the short talk, I plan to describe an effort underway to make our data and tools more powerful, accessible, and easier to use by migrating most of our computational activities from on-premises resources to the public cloud. And I'll also describe an exciting new tool we released called Simularium, which aims to make it easier for computational biologists to share and present their simulation results directly in a web browser. I'll also get into a vision of how these types of technologies can work together with standardization to make our science more robust, reproducible, and fair, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
So take a look at this time series movie and it shows the cells we work on here at the Institute undergoing division and just uh, appreciate the beauty, complexity and the wonderment they may inspire while I break down an early draft of our mission statement. I'll read aloud now. Our mission is to understand how cells, the fundamental units of life, organize themselves and change. To do this, one of our primary activities is to integrate cell images collected on our microscopes with genomics and other data to understand how cells organize and how those organizational relationships change over time. But in the second half of the mission, we say, in doing so, we will develop and democratize tools to discover new biology as a community and accelerate research towards understanding health and treating disease. In our vision statement, we say in five years, we'll systematically explore millions of human cells representing different functions. This first part of our vision is illustrated loosely on the left side of our slide, where at the highest level, we collect data and analyze various types of, of information towards understanding how cells function. And to deal with data from hundreds of thousands of cells, we've developed and released several different approaches for data integration. I've animated three of these on the right side of this slide with references that you can dig into. Each approach has its own pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses, but importantly, they all contribute to a growing quiver of tools, which becomes a collective that together is helping us to assemble and integrate our microscopy and genomics information to together into new ways. It's not only allowing us to approach an otherwise overwhelming amount of information from new angles to finally study living cells in a combined and holistic manner, but it's enabling us to quantify how cells are organized and also being, beginning to help us uncover testable rules, hypotheses, and mechanisms that can describe how these cells might accomplish the sophisticated emergent behaviors I showed in that earlier slide. So you can learn more about our science from yesterday's reported presentations and uh, by exploring our website. But for the rest of the talk, I really wanna focus the, on the second half of this vision statement at the bottom here. It's very important and statement, which says, and we want to develop publicly available tools to enable any biologist, researcher, or clinician to map and compare the organization of cells and their components to one another. So in short, we wanna take all the science that my teammates perform and present, which is loosely summarized on this top row here and provide it to the community in a manner that enables others to reproduce the science use it towards their own experiments and to extend these methods and results as a community. How do we plan to get better at this in the coming years? So I'll start again with this illustration to provide a high level description of how data currently flows through our analysis pipelines. And in most cases, we begin in the upper left by collecting data from human cells in the form of 3D images or genomics information. We process it to make discoveries or re refine hypotheses and draw conclusions. And we share as much of this work as possible with researchers and other audiences in the form of publications, data sets, and other research resources like computational analysis tools, which all looks pretty clean and simple in this illustration. But in reality, our current approaches to accomplish this are um, many years old. They weren't designed with the flexibility that we need in 2022. They're complicated. And we realize that our data flow pipelines can be made much more efficient often more generalized or automated and potentially much more powerful. Over the past eight months, we've started a new cross team data flow program at our institute that aims to improve our data flow pipelines and our software development methods. We're currently training and enculturating our scientists and engineers to, to help maximize the way that they work together and code to improve the robustness, reproducibility and reusability of our science as well as our resources. So the major changes we're going to move from on-premises compute resources into the public cloud. We currently perform most of our work using hardware located in our building in Seattle, and then we export that data as a separate step to the public cloud, often requiring a major secondary engineering effort. When we move into the cloud, a lot of that can be simplified where the stuff that our scientists are doing in the cloud and that our engineers are working on can become accessible to the public much with a much easier step and, and limited uh, additional engineering effort required. So as we work to as that longer term plan, we already have several useful resources available for researchers, teachers, and students can use today. And I've, we've grouped them into six categories on the slide. I'm just gonna use this as a reference to highlight a few and then we'll take a deep dive into that Simularian project I mentioned earlier. 
So first we'll zoom in on one of our most impactful resources, the cells themselves, where we carefully add fluorescent tags to the cells using gene editing, which results in extremely clean data compared to technologies like transient transfection. So on the right side of the slide, I'm showing just four out of 52 uh, lines, cell lines that are currently available as frozen vials in the cell catalog on allencell.org. And in the center, I'm just showing that, um, of course, the cells grow in 3D. Uh, we also collect data and image the cells in 3D, but just showing you the high quality uh, data that you can get out with optical microscopy of these uh, beautiful microtubule fibers, for example, as well as one of our rendering technologies that gives you a, a much easier intuition to understand the 3D spatial relationships called agave, which is available on our website. This endogenous gene editing technology coupled with months of meticulous quality control in the lab provides cells that generate beautiful data, which looks like this for a cell line where the nuclear lamina was made visible by tagging the lamin B protein. And again, frozen vials of these cells and the plasmids used to generate them are all available in the cell catalog at the URL, which is shown in dark blue in the top of the slide there. Um, called uh, allencell.org and you can just navigate to it through the menu here under the Allen Cell collection. On that page, you'll also find detailed information about each cell line. So if you uh, click through the table of the cell lines that are available, you'll come to a page with a variety of uh, different quality control measures and the outputs of those. Um, so you can analyze the, the cells that you're interested in using. There's also a forum designed to help uh, people raise, maintain, and manipulate uh, these cells or stem cells in general in their own labs. So if we zoom now into another common process in quantitative cell biology segmentation, um, no matter what cells you're using in your lab, you're likely gonna wanna segment images of your data to be able to get uh, good results. And rather than go into the code, which I don't have time to, or the, or the options available in our segment or software, I think it's best to just show you the output. So if you compare this to our old methods of segmentation um, involving kind of classic watershed technologies, the new segmentation gives you much better results of the morphology that you can see on the left side of the input data and it is, of course, operating in three dimensions. And you can just imagine how this would improve your uh, quantitative calculations, volume or surface area measurements, especially when you do a machine learning option on it uh, to, to really do high throughput and, and top quality. So the challenge with that software is it's been available for a few years, but it's, it's not really for everybody because it requires you to touch code. Um, it's written in Python, one of the most friendly soft, uh, software languages in the world. Um, and it's uh, accessible in Jupyter Notebooks, which I'm told is even more friendly, but um, you still have to get in and uh, manipulate the code to, to use it. So we wanted to eliminate that step to make it more useful for other people, uh, uh, biologists who aren't, who aren't familiar with terminal windows and Python interfaces. And I just wanted to first discuss the word democratization. So that, that step to make it easier to get it into a graphic user interface requires additional engineering. And the formal definition of democratization is to make something accessible to all, but that can easily become an infinite amount of work. So I like to modify that with the word realistic to say that we'll do our best to democratize where it makes the most sense. And I also like to modify accessible and all because democratization means not only posting our data and tools, but actually making them easy to use for as many different and particular audiences as we can. It takes a lot of extra effort, so we have to pick and choose where we can spend that time. So one of our efforts um, was to pull that Python wrapped software segmenter into a popular new tool that was spearheaded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative called Napari because it's written in Python and, and uh, segmenters written in Python and they've provided an API to design plugins for their uh, otherwise generalized um, visual analysis interface. Um, we're able to provide access to those parameters for any biologist without needing to touch any code. So now I wanna show you one of my favorite topics, 3D visual analysis. And I'm going to move pretty quickly through this. We've described it a few times over the years, but 
this is really combining our image uh, or just our data sets um, as well as providing educational access to these. So we've got tens of thousands of cells segmented from our data collection and we want to uh, provide easy access to those. You don't want to have to download tens of thousands of cells to explore their relationships. Um, so directly in a browser, you can go to cfe.allencell.org and uh, explore measurements of the cells, as well as uh, roll over each one of these dots, which represents a single cell, and instantly see a thumbnail of what it looks like. You can collect those thumbnails into a gallery and then if you click on one of those images, it will take you directly in your web browser to a volumetric viewer where you get all the tools you would expect of a volumetric viewer, such as the ability to rotate the image, um, modify parameters to, to, to highlight certain data, such as the transfer function relative to the histogram. And we've opened up this software recently to support more than just one data set. We have three new data sets available, including our cell systems paper, where our uh, cardiomyocytes are, and our fish um, experiments are, are now available inside. And they, they just look beautiful when you use that path traced agave method directly in your web browser. So I encourage you to check that out. So up next, I'll briefly describe that we have uh, publications on our site and our goal with moving to the cloud is to make the code that we use in the analyses in these publications as readily available as possible. And um, that, that's uh, under the analysis and modeling as well as the digital tools portion of the website. And to transition to our last speaker, I want to get into our educational resources page and our simulation page. Um, so we have educational resources where uh, teachers have explained how they use our various scientific tools in their classroom. And some of the teachers have, um, uh, professors have taken these to extremes to have peer reviewed publications on lesson plans available. One of our favorite or most popular tools is this um, integrated model we made a few years ago with 14 channels of organelles uh, called the Visual Guide to Human Cells. Um, but you can see at the, at the resolution of light microscopy as you zoom in, you don't really get any new information. And I come from a background in structural biology that uh, David Goodsell is gonna cover in a few minutes. So I'm excited to know what the details are. Um, and not only do we want to be able to zoom in to our cell data and see what's happening inside, we want to be able to understand it. So to, to pull out the, the important information such as uh, actin filamentation occurring here, and really to take it to the next level of understanding to be able to probe that, to experiment with it, explore it, uh, change parameters, understand cause and effect. But when we see one of our cells drawn to scale from this image behind me, if you uh, simulate that to what it looks like in an optical microscope, it's pretty unsatisfying. However, as, as we'll see in the last presentation today, you can take existing information such as models of cell events and frame them into the context of whole cells as a way of annotating and bringing together a community of information into this world. So these are my last few slides here and just, um, want you to get a chance to visit this tool Simularium where the pain points in the modeling world are, are sharing the simulation. And this often excludes biologists who are extremely knowledgeable about the subject matter from actually diving deep into the data to be able to understand it, to review it for papers, to participate in iterating and improving it. And it doesn't have to be that way. So all this code here is doing nothing more than changing these little numeric parameters for uh, components that biologists understand even from a textbook drawing. So we wanna be able to help people modify inputs, analyze the outputs of a simulation and do that without needing to run code by running it in the cloud itself. We've built the second half of this where simulations produced in any simulation engine anywhere that you have parts moving over space and time can be visualized on the website and if you go to simularium.allencell.org uh, you can interact with these and see the two-dimensional plots and the relationships to the 3d thing uh, 
3D simulations and uh, Matt Akamatsu is gonna do a much better description of this later today. We've got uh, examples of several models online and uh, professors are, uh, or authors are even getting these uh, accepted as supplementary materials and publications. So if you want people to be able to interact with your data, that's an option. So I wanna thank everyone at the Institute who does all the hard work. Uh, mention that on our website, we have a link to many available jobs in engineering and science. Thank the Cell Science Committee, and I'll just take 10 seconds here to introduce David. Um, nobody knows more about multi-scale biology from atoms to whole cells than David. He's a prolific author, not just in journals, but illustrated books on biology, fine art, and of course, the very informative molecule of the month on the Protein Data Bank website. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce a career-long inspiration, David Goodsell. Well, many thanks, Graham. And boy, you know, it's it's always such a pleasure to see the the toolbox that you're building at the Allen Institute to make uh, to make all that beautiful data available to, to people like me, <laughs> you know, to make it accessible. Um, okay, so I'd just like to take a few minutes today at this talk and present uh, some of the work that we're doing on building structural models of entire cells. So this goes forward. Oh, that didn't work. That didn't work. I'm not able to make the uh, slides go forward. If you click one more time, I think the first click was to accept. There, we go. there you go. Thanks. Um, so the, the overall hypothesis of this is we're still at the tool building stage. So our hypothesis is, is it possible to create and visualize a comprehensive model, structural model of a whole cell that has macromolecular detail and that integrates as much experimental data as we can find? So that's our overall goal for this. Um, and I mean, as is completely apparent with all the talks yesterday and all the talks that we're going to hear today, there are a bunch of orthogonal challenges uh, to this type of a goal. Biology itself is intrinsically super complex with volume occupied spaces, strange wacky shapes, fibers, specific interactions between all those wacky shapes. And it, so there are a lot of things to solve just posed by the biology. Second, we live in a, a world of multiple sciences working on their own approach to this. So there's a continual problem of finding data, integrating it and curating it uh, so that it all fits together. How do we find what we need? And then finally, uh, these models are, are really challenging uh, the computational infrastructure that we have now. They're, they're big, big models. So uh, just building them and the visualization uh, is, is a big challenge. So I started this work uh, 30 years ago um, uh, and uh, started it with the, the most, um, the, the cell that had the most information that, that I could find, which was E. coli. And so now if we set the Wayback Machine to 1991, when I set myself this goal, can I draw a picture of um, E. coli that shows where all the macromolecules are? And so the tools I had at the time were going to the library and using the citation index. We didn't have PubMed or anything like that. Uh, the PDB, uh, I used a, um, a local version of it on our computers, there really wasn't a, a web interface with searches or anything. And there were only 700 structures at the time. Uh, and proteomics, what it looked like uh, was people doing these big uh, 2D gels and then going one spot at a time and trying to figure out what, what protein was what. So there, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of information at the time. Uh, and so there was just barely enough to do a credible picture of, um, of what the cellular interior looks like. And it turns out when I was putting this picture together for an article in, in Tibbs, uh, one of the big things that I had to search for uh, were papers that gave me ideas of the range of molecular weights of typical proteins across the whole proteome. And then the oligomeric, uh, oligomeric state of those proteins across the whole proteome. And so then I just kind of made up a picture based on those kind of values. So all of these, these proteins are about the right size and the, the right um, oligomeric state. Later on, uh, 
10 years or so later, much more information, uh, the internet was starting to take off, right? So information was much more available. And I was finally able to start drawing pictures where every molecule has a name, okay? Uh, and then more recently, uh, last year, I updated this picture. Uh, and now it's, it's very possible, at least for well-studied cells like E. coli, to create uh, illustrations that uh, where every molecule has a name <clears throat> and every molecule has structural information to support it. Quite amazing. So, I mean, there are beautiful EM structures to help support this um, uh, flagellar motor, uh, really amazing structures of ribosomes and ribosomes in expressomes bound to RNA polymerase, you know, just everything you need is uh, in the PDB or in the EM data bank. And proteomics have come such a long way uh, that there's really solid, solid information on which things need to be included and how many of them are. So we're good to go on that. Um, so most of uh, this work, this is a very familiar slide, and Graham just showed it. Uh, most of my work up until about 10 years ago um, was centered on those kind of hand-drawn illustrations because computational uh, methods weren't really up to building uh, 3D models uh, of, of, this, of these systems. That all changed when Graham uh, joined the lab as a grad student with, uh, with Art Olson uh, and set the task of uh, creating uh, real 3D models uh, to address the same goal. And so this is just a quick uh, summary of, of the approach that he worked up uh, in a program called CellPack. So he did this in his graduate work, uh, collaborating with a very talented software developer in, in the lab, Ludovic Auden, and also with some help from a computer graphics expert uh, in Vienna, Ivan Viola. Uh, and the approach in CellPack uh, that Graham and Ludo developed is to define containers in space. For instance, this is an HIV uh, virion uh, that defines where the membranes should be and other compartments in the cell, like this capsid at the center of the HIV. And then also to define a recipe of ingredients, structures for each of the individual macromolecules and information like how many of them you need and where they're going to go, whether they're membrane proteins or not, et cetera, et cetera. And then you combine that container with the ingredients to build instances of uh, the 3D model that are consistent with that recipe and that um, uh, those containers, but place things randomly uh, according to the instructions. So we continued uh, since uh, since since Graham moved to the Allen Institute. We've continued development of um, of cell pack models, and uh, recently, in the past two years or so, uh, it's all kind of all come together. And we're building models of whole mycoplasma uh, cells. And so uh, the work I'm going to describe here was done over the last two years by a postdoc, Martina Martin, uh, of course, with the help of Aludo. Um, and this was done in collaboration with Marcus Covert and Jonathan Carr, um, supported by um, uh, Marcus's uh, Discovery Center Award uh, from the Allen Institute. And so uh, this was a real boon to, to, to meet up with uh, Marcus because their whole cell models uh, provide all the information that we need um, to, to jump into building these models. The, the whole cell models define uh, expression levels, uh, metabolic pathways and everything. And so uh, we can leverage this and just walk in and extract out a perfect proteome uh, with concentrations and locations for each of the um, uh, each of the proteins in the cell. So our task is then to come up with a 3D conception of of one of those snapshots along the uh, the uh, the life cycle of the cell that's defined in these simulations. So you can think of it as as going to his uh, his whole cell viewer here and just adding another window down at the bottom that has a structural snapshot at each uh, time point in the cell. Uh, so Martina, the, her major task over the past couple of years has been to develop a recipe uh, of, of structural models for um, all of the proteins uh, in this cell. And so she came up with a workflow here that starts with methods that 
uh, we're very confident in. And if that doesn't work, then adding additional methods uh, uh, to use for, for things that we don't have uh, really solid structural information. So the first thing she does is looks for experimental structures or structures that um, have been modeled by, uh, by other groups with um, uh, sophisticated modeling methods. If we can't find those, we then go to homology modeling, uh, which is pretty effective for proteins that are monomers or homomeric uh, complexes. And then finally for big complicated things like ribosomes and SMC proteins and polymerases, uh, we go and uh, use uh, uh, homologs from, uh, from other organisms. Uh, so that's her overall pathway. She's come up with a nice uh, confidence score uh, based on, on these different methods as well, just so that we can uh, keep track of that. This is what her final proteome looks like for the mycoplasma genitalium cell. So here, uh, cytoplasmic soluble proteins, membrane proteins, and things that are secreted. Um, and she's colored these ones here by this confidence measure that she's developed, uh, which highlights the not surprising uh, uh, concept that the membrane ingredients are, we have much less confidence in the structures of those just because they're um, experimentally structurally much more difficult to, to determine, at least until recently, uh, cryo-EM is, is changing all of that, of course. Uh, so the nucleoid of these, uh, these cells is a special challenge just because it has a lot of um, spatial information that has to be incorporated. Uh, it's not easy, as easy just to use a, a, a random uh, placement method to, to define that. So I wrote up a, a program to, to create models of the entire nucleoid. Um, and it uses a lattice-based lattice -based method uh, that models um, a circular chromosome and superhelical plectinemes out of that, as well as RNA, um, uh, RNA positions. Uh, the the lattice-based method allows uh, uh, a method that will create a, um, a nucleoid model that's not knotted. Uh, more uh, random walk approaches sometimes uh, have troubles with making very, very knotted, uh, um, uh, knotted models. Uh, and so the, the nucleoid is generated first on a lattice and then it's uh, um, optimized off lattice uh, and adding uh, large, large nuclear, nucleoid associated proteins and ribosomes. And so this model ends up uh, being a coarse grain model of the, the DNA, 10 base pairs per bead, similar 10, ba base, 10 bases per bead for RNA, and then a bunch of uh, single spheres that represent the, um, uh, the, new, the proteins and uh, ribosomes. Why am I not going forward again? There we go. Okay, and so once the, that proteome was put together and the nucleoid model was put together, we'll go backwards. Um, then we turn to Ludo. I'm having trouble with my forward and backwards here. Um, you can let me know which slide you want to be on. And yeah, can, can you take control of this? I'm having some latency problems. Um, I, I want the one that has Ludo's name at the top. Uh, let me know which one. This, this one okay. right here. Um, and can you just control it for the rest of the talk? Sure. Um, so uh, once we have that proteome in place, structural proteome and uh, the nucleoid model, we go to Ludo's tools and he's built this really quite amazing um, online uh, curation tool that he calls Mesoscope that provides um, the uh, tools for creating a big spreadsheet with the whole proteome where you can put concentrations, uh, abundances, uh, what structures you're using for what, et cetera. And so it has that um, spreadsheet, has a nice visual representation of the whole proteome. So you can just click on dots uh, to find proteins. Uh, and then for each of those proteins, uh, uh, curate 
uh, the way they're represented in the model, for instance, making sure the membrane's in the right place for membrane proteins and what uh, representation, kind of coarse grain representation you're using for the protein. And so this tool lets you flip through the hundreds and hundreds of molecules very quickly uh, and curate them, make sure everything is right. This has been an essential tool uh, for managing the, the information for these complex models. And so once the, that whole recipe is put together in Mesoscope, uh, it's exported along with the nucleoid model uh, into a, a GPU accelerated version of CellPack, which builds a, a, a quick and dirty model, uh, dropping everything in the right place, has a bunch of overlaps. Here's a, uh, um, a representation where things that have steric contacts are in red, so you can see there are a bunch of problems. So then it goes through uh, two uh, relaxation steps to resolve those steric complex, and then finally um, exported uh, to be displayed in things like MALSTAR back in the, uh, the mesoscope window. Uh, so we, he's put together this whole workflow uh, for, um, for creating and exporting and visualizing uh, these, these complex model, models. All of this is described in our uh, recent uh, paper in uh, Journal Molecular Biology. So you can take a peek at that if you want to see more details. And then go ahead to the next one, uh, Martina. Now she's finishing up her postdoc with us and um, uh, I've tasked her with creating a nice little uh, video that'll be a tour through this model. You can go ahead and start that uh, video turning. Um, and so this is her first little screen test uh, just showing um, some of the tools that we have for visualization, like these uh, uh, clipping planes that'll selectively clip away part of the molecule. This clipped away first the membrane and then clipped away the soluble things. Uh, and there's also a nice level of detail control in this visualization that as things get closer, you use models of higher resolution so you can see more details. This is kind of choppy uh, due, to, due to the latency of this. Uh, after the talk, I'll put um, a link in the chat uh, for you to look at this video. Um, and it, it's all of it also available for uh, download if you want to grab it. And hopefully uh, in the next couple of months, she'll have a, a more detailed uh, video to, to really explore all the, the fun details of this. Okay, uh, you can go to the next slide. Which uh, these are the kind of games we're playing with the, the model now. Um, so in the original, Mar Marcus's original paper describing the whole cell models of mycoplasma genitalium, they explored a bunch of different um, uh, properties of, of, the, of the simulations. For instance, the um, uh, exploration of the RNA polymerase. So these are regions of the, the genome that have been explored since the last cell division. So we can color by that. We can color by the, um, the gene expression at any given time. Um, or uh, the expression of different proteins, you know, the concentration of, of particular proteins at any time point. So those are the kinds of, of games we're playing with the models right now. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. Can, can we get the next one? Uh, there we go. And so uh, moving on from this, uh, just recently, uh, I've been uh, jumping into this and leveraging all the work that Martina uh, has been doing so that, that I can learn how to use the tools now, right? Uh, and so we've been uh, leveraging that model to create some models of the minimal cell, the, uh, the Venture Institute SYN3A cell, which is quite sim similar. And so it, as is often the case when I start these pro projects, I do a painting first, just so I'll kind of uh, get a concept in my mind for the kind of things that we're going to have to incorporate into the into the models. This is a painting that that I actually finished on Tuesday. Um, I chose to do a dividing cell because the SYN 3A, the, the transition from SYN 30 to SYN 3A uh, was adding back a few things that had to do with cell division. So I wanted to nod to that. Uh, here's the first draft of the 3D model. Um, based on proteomic information and collaborations with, uh, or information from, from John, uh, Zan, and Elizabeth. 
Uh, and one of the fun things about this, uh, this project was that I taught myself how to, how to use AlphaFold uh, to come up with structural models for a hundred proteins that uh, were uncharacterized and that there weren't really good homologs in the mycoplasma genitalium model. Uh, and so boy, that, that was great fun. Um, and dropped out some really fun stuff like this glycolipid synthase uh, looks very credible to me. You know, I kind of believe that. And this wacky spectrony looking thing, uh, who knows if it's real. Uh, a bunch of the proteins just ended up doing almost nothing. They're, maybe they're subunits of, of larger, uh, larger complexes. And then of course there always were a few uh, alpha fold spaghetti structures that you know you can just toss out and help you find a different way to uh, to solve it. Uh, so I think uh, that's what I have to say. I'll just finish up. Can we go to the last acknowledgement slide? Um, I'll, I'll just finish up that I, I'm very lucky in my career now to, to be able to wear two hats. Um, and so I do research with the, um, uh, at, at Scripps Research uh, with, with three, other, three other labs uh, and um, uh, work with the uh, RCSP PDB uh, on educational, um, uh, education and outreach efforts. Uh, and then uh, back on that slide, three, people to acknowledge down at the bottom, of course, the NIH for supporting the whole development of CellPAC, uh, the, uh, the PDB for providing me wonderful ways to, to make this, uh, these models and uh, paintings available uh, to, to a bunch of, of different people. And of course, to the um, Marcus Covert and the Allen Institute for the support for uh, Martinez postdoc. And so I can take some questions. If there's time, I think I'm a little over. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. I'm a bioinformatics analyst here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science, and I will be moderating the Q&A for the next few speakers. Um, we have a few questions in uh, the Q&A panel. We have time for just one question to answer live. Um, David, question, how do different species in the model interact, like protein-protein interactions, protein RNA, etc.? Yeah, so uh, th this is a great, great question. And actually is the subject of hopefully, when we hear about it, our next five year uh, block of time uh, on our grant. Right now, uh, everything is treated as a preformed complex and then dropped into the model. But we're hoping to, to come up with much more flexible ways of doing that over the, uh, the next granting cycle. But yeah, that's, great. A great, that's a great question. Thank you, David, um, for a great talk. There are a few more questions um, in the Q&A panel. Um, please type in the answers whenever you get a chance. Um, we're gonna move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Sonia Vikovic. Dr. Vikovic is currently a Wallenberg Fellow at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, and will soon be starting as an Assistant Professor of Bioengineering at Columbia University. Her research advances the application of spatial transcriptomics at scale by presenting spatial multi-omics or SM omics as a fully automated high throughput all sequencing based platform for combined and spatially resolved transcriptomics and antibody based protein measurements. Her talk today is titled SM omics as an automated platform for high throughput spatial multi-omics. Welcome Sonia. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so thank you for the very nice introduction. And I guess I'll be the one switching gears a little bit um, during this session. So I'll try to introduce the concepts of spatial transcriptomics and follow up on, on different kinds of resolutions and updates and update into spatial multiomics. So given, you know, I was advised to also um, give an introduction to the topic um, of spatial transcriptomics, I will try to do that. Um, okay, so how we started thinking about the problem of spatial transcriptomics is that we started looking at a lot of histology images. So for, your, for those of you who are not familiar, we're looking at the tissue microarray, uh, five times 10 spots. Each spot represents uh, tissue, um, in this case, colorectal cancer tissue from uh, 50 different patients. 
Um, it's hem hemtoxyl and eosin stain, which means that you get different shades of the cells um, and cell surroundings as shades of purple and pink. And a trained pathologist would go in and say directly, oh, this is definitely colorectal cancer. Um, I can maybe even guess the grading. Um, however, um, these types of approaches are based on um, very extensive pathologist training um, and or um, staining these tissues for one two markers that we have in advance to choose um, for cell stainings. Um, so we were very interested in the tissue microenvironments in cancers, and we tried to ask uh, the following question. Um, so if we take concept of microarrays, but instead of making a tissue microarray, we ask the question, take each and single tissue from the previous slide and kind of split it into a grid or split it into a microarray. And what would happen if in each voxel, which is kind of this highlighted box in the tissue, uh, we could extract um, some kind of unbiased genome-wide information, for example, RNA sequencing, but that we also want um, to somehow encode during the library preparation protocol um, information where each of these voxels came from originally in our images. Um, in order to do this, uh, we developed a technology we termed spatial transcriptomics or ST for short. So uh, we kind of took the concept of creating a grid, uh, but instead of uh, creating a tissue microarray, we created a spatial microarray. What does this mean? This means we took a glass slide, we bought a thousand oligos from IDT, and we deposited these 1,000 different oligos into 1,000 different spots uh, on an array, creating a 33 times 35 matrix. So again, to recapitulate, each spot in this matrix holds a different uh, spatial barcode. A spatial barcode is just an ATGC sequence that we chose and deposited at a certain X and Y position in a matrix. Um, if we switch uh, to the right-hand side, what we would see is that uh, we have an Illumina adapter, we have a spatial barcode, a UMI sequence uh, for collapsing the barcodes, and a PolyDT sequence. So it wasn't only just a regular microarray, it was a spatial microarray and it was compatible with Illumina sequencing. So what happens if we have a lot of these primers deposited on a glass slide? The next step, what we do um, is if we uh, look at the left-hand side, we would place a tissue section on top of our microarray. We would do hematoxylin and eosin staining, same as in the first slide when the pathologists were looking at collected cancer samples. Um, and we would uh, image the samples and image the sections. So we would collect that type of pathology information. But at the same time that we were recording the pathology and the histology from these tissue sections, we were also recording the relative positions of the tissue to our spatial microarray. Um, after that, uh, we switch uh, from the microscope to doing enzymatic reactions on the tissue on the array surface. Um, so what happens then is that we're gently permeabilizing the tissue, which you see in the side view. Um, and after that, the, the mRNAs that are polyadenylated, they bind to our polyDT capture probes um, on the microarray surface. And we can now do cDNA synthesis in situ, which means we are now copying the mRNA information on top of our spatial barcodes. Um, the next step is pretty simple. We cleave these products from the microarray surface we prepare Illumina Paradigm libraries and we sequence them. So what happens is that before sequencing, we were only privy to the histology information pathologists have had for decades. But after sequencing, they're now privy to information of uh, basically what genes are expressed in different parts of the tissue at a resolution of 100 microns. Um, so I would say that this is where we ended 2016-17. It was end of a granting cycle. It was end of grad school. Um, so we took a little bit two directions. One direction was we wanted this technology to be widely available. Um, so it is currently commercialized as the busy product from 10X Genomics. Um, and we took a second effort, which is that we really wanted to see this technology um, in action solving or trying to solve a biological problem. Um, in order to do that, we paired uh, up with Hamali Fatnani and Rich Bonneau um, in New York. 
um, to ask the question, can we say something using spatial transcriptomics about spatial and temporal dynamics of ALS? So ALS is a motor neuron disease. Um, unfortunately, three to five years after diagnosis is always fatal. 90% um, of cases are sporadic and 10% are familial. And what we know about the disease or knew before this study was that uh, motor neurons died in a specific part of the spinal cord called the ventral horn. So the ventral horn is the part of the left hand side, the orange color part of the right hand side of the slide. So given that motor neurons die, we also knew that the motor neurons uh, are the ones because they die, they cause the paralysis, eventual death. But we, we also knew that it's not just them dying. It's also a lot of cell autonomous and non-autonomous processes that contribute to the motor neuron loss. Um, so what we did with spatial transcriptomics is we profiled over 1,900 tissue sections in about nine months time, um, which means we created a data set of 190 thousand different spatial spots that on the right hand side you see um, aligned on top of each other in a common coordinate framework system and this basically uh, each of these spots held information about 10,000 genes worth of expression. So we ended up with about 3 billion data points um, in our study. Um, so first we wanted to validate the results um, on a few genes. So uh, the middle image is our spatial transcriptomics data and expression of three specific genes for three specific areas in the spinal cord. And again, uh, we are highlighting the ventral horn. And the right head side was our first attempt for doing any type of multimodal uh, analysis with this data is what would happen if we would pair the spatial transcriptomics data on adjacent sections with immunofluorescence. Uh, well, this was very nice for validation purposes. It's not that, you know, we, we created this huge data set just to look at a few genes. Uh, we also wanted to look at the biology of um, uh, kind of gene to gene uh, expression patterns. Um, so what you're seeing now is uh, because we had a temporal com component to our study, which means left to right uh, columns uh, denote uh, different postnatal days, P30 to P120. Um, so this is all mouse, mice data. Uh, top panel de denotes the wild type condition, while the bottom panel denotes the SOD1 or ALS condition. Um, and what can you see is that, for example, GFAP, which is also a known marker of gliosis, and we were expecting uh, differences in GFAP expression, that at P100, P120 in the bottom panel in the ALS condition, um, the gene expression goes up significantly compared to the other um, data we were looking at. Uh, but what was interesting is to look at gene modules. Um, so uh, if we would look at just, for example, the ventral horn where the motor neurons die and its uh, dynamics across time. Uh, so the top panel, we have now uh, four different uh, time points in our study. And the y-axis represents the log fold ratios of genes that are over or under expressed in a certain SOD1, so ALS condition versus wild type in certain uh, different uh, time points. And we see that a lot of different genes, the more the disease progresses, the more genes we also pick up. What was interesting is, for example, at P100 time point that we're highlighting here, we see a, a lot of up and down regulated genes, but we also picked up uh, uh, genes, for example, that we knew about, like GFAB that I presented in the previous slide, but genes that were unknown that contribute to motor neuron loss, like peroxyredoxin cis 6. Um, so, of course, we were also interested in not connecting only gene gene modules that change over time, but try to figure out which exact cells contribute um, to the differences in expression over time. Um, to do this, we developed a hierarchical model that combines spatial, temporal, and, and single nucleus of single, single cell sequencing data. Um, and when we use this model, then we can dig a little bit more into the cell types. So for example, on the right-hand side, uh, you would see um, uh, green, uh, green dots that represent all the dendrocytes from the single cell data. If we would map those on top of our uh, spatial data in the spinal cords, we would see that those are uh, significant to express. So the colors red um, in the white matter, which again, we were, we were expecting. 
Um, so after this was done and we definitely uh, picked up a few very interesting targets during this study. And I would say that two of them now are part of clinical trials um, in US-based pharma companies. Uh, we asked the following question. So we knew that the resolution of the original ST technology uh, needed improvement. Uh, so instead of looking at these 100 micron tissue boxes, we wanted to uh, look at single cells. Even Sonia, you cut out for a moment if you want to just say your last sentence again. Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, we knew that the technology, the ST original technology was at 100 micron resolution, and we knew that we needed to improve that. So in order to do that, um, we developed a concept. Uh, we termed HDST or high definition spatial transcriptomics. So on the left-hand side, you would see um, the original SD microarray. So 100 micron voxels, we bought 1000 oligos and inkjet printed them on glass slides. Uh, you didn't need to do any decoding because you knew exactly where you deposited each oligo. But in order to produce a high density array, um, you, we would need to buy approximately 2000 times 800 different oligos. So 2 million or so different oligos from IDT, which is absolutely impossible, of course. And beyond pricey. Uh, so instead, we we used an, reused an old technology, random bead arrays developed by David Volt and the Illumina uh, in the 90s, um, and basically first made a bead pool. Um, bead pool means that we took beads, we bought around 60 different oligos from IDT, we attached six different oligos um, to different beads in, the, um, in a plate. Then we mushed this, all of these beads into one tube and redistributed into 200 different wells with 200 new oligos that would attach to the first oligo on the bead, which means after one um, generation of split and pull, what would happen is that would, we would have approximately 60 times 200 different uh, uniquely barcoded beads. And we would repeat this again to get around 2 million different beads. Then these 2 million different beads would be deposited in uh, silicon wafer etched wells where each one bead would fit into one well. And after that, um, we would have to decode where each bead is in this random array. Um, so if you look on the right hand side on the oligo composition, you would see that our spatial barcode is um, comprised of three different um, oligos that were originally used in the split and pool and the complementary Psi-3 or Psi-5 labeled oligos were used to decode these arrays, which was nicely done at Illumina and saved us a lot of effort and work. Um, after that, um, you can of course repeat all the same uh, things you could do with the original SD technology. So we could place a fr fresh frozen tissue section on top of the arrays in this case, we're looking at the main olfactory bulb of the mouse brain. Uh, we could uh, differentiate the different morphological layers in this uh, H&E image, and we can connect to different cell types. For example, we are highlighting uh, cell types called um, olfactory bulb inhibitory neurons and neuroblasts um, in the images. Um, I think when that was done, and that was also now uh, is a process of being commercialized by 10X, we want to take a step back um, and kind of get a feeling how hard it is to do spatial multimodal analysis and spatial multimodal protocols. So the first and obvious thing to do was, can we do spatial transcriptomics, but instead of hematoxylin and using staining, we would use um, some type of uh, immunofluorescence for detecting um, antibody-based uh, proteins in the sections. Um, I think everyone who has worked with, with uh, immunofluorescence know there's always the limitation of spectral overlap between the different colors we can use at the, at the same time. So I think, you know, very well-versed labs and, and uh, microscope maybe can do a five plex of different colors but most people do a two or three plex um, reaction. Uh, but it was a good kind of initial protocol to get to work with tissues and antibodies at the same time. 
but we wanted to expand that concept into doing uh, antibody-based proteomics using uh, site-seq um, barcoded antibodies. Um, in order to do that, we can still do the IF stainings and do our two to three markers um, um, and use microscopy to decode them. Uh, but we can uh, add a pool of site-seq antibodies where each antibody then um, has an, its own barcode. Um, and we can pull that bar to our spatial array surface. So now we are paired and sequencing our antibody tag libraries and a cDNA library. So if we switch gears to the right-hand side of the image, what you would see is the top panel would denote our Illumina sequenced antibody tags uh, for two um, distinct targets in the mouse spleen compared to their expression we captured with spatial transcriptomics of the same tissue sections, uh, again, in the, in the spleen. So with this, uh, I don't want to run out of time. So I think I would just switch to acknowledgements and definitely I have a lot of people to acknowledge, especially at the Broad, SciLife Lab, uh, New York Genome Center, Flat Tire and Illumina and my uh, very, very nice funding sources, the Wallenberg Foundation and Target ALS. So with this, I think, I, I hope I have time for some questions. Thank you, Sonia, for a great presentation. Um, I have one question. If you have both like immunofluorescence uh, protein information and transcript information, how redundant is the information that you're getting from those two modalities? So I, I think it depends on your biological application. I would say, I'm, I would say, for example, in the brain, it might be um, in some cell types, redundant, the others not, I would definitely highlight it's not redundant when you work with cancer samples, because there you want to, you want to focus a lot on immunophenotyping, where either your, your IF information or your um, SISIC tags have to come along uh, very nicely. Thank you. Uh, and then one more question, how do you select the genes and proteins that you're going to target in your panel? And like how how many do you think are generally enough to answer? Absolutely. So on the spatial transcriptomic side, we don't do a panel. We do kind of whole transcriptome sequencing that's polyadenylated or polyase-based, polyT-based uh, capture. Uh, on the protein side, we've gone up to 22 different uh, site seq tags plus three different IF-based uh, measurements uh, without too much problems, to be honest. Uh, the, the limiting factor was more to get a good panel uh, of antibodies to work together than actually coupling those to the surface and reading them out with the Lumina sequencing. Great, thank you, Sonia, so much. Um, we're gonna move on to the next presentation now. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Sheila Gazanfar. She is currently a Royal Society Newton International Fellow and Postdoctoral Research Associate at the University of Cambridge. She will be opening her lab as a lecturer and Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Research Fellow at the University of Sydney in May of 2022. Her lab will focus on designing statistical approaches for the analysis of spatial single cell genomics data alongside building techniques for effectively integrating spatial molecular resolved genomics data with dissociated single cell transcriptomics and multi-omics data types. Her talk today is titled Data Integration for Molecule Resolved Spatial Gene Expression of Mouse Organogenesis. Welcome, Sheila. Thanks so much for that introduction, Tanya. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really impressed by all the wonderful talks so far. Now, um, the topic data integration from multi-omics to imaging, I think it's such a fantastic theme. Um, and I think it really gets to the heart of where a lot of developmental biology um, is, is uh, research is going towards. So during uh, gastrulation and organogenesis, uh, a mouse embryo, it develops from a relatively simple uh, three germ layer structure into a complex layer of uh, a mix of cell types that will give rise to a number of distinct uh, organs along the entire body plan. 
So previously, uh, we've generated a map of dissociated cells during this process. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can see that there's a massive shift in the diversity of transcriptional profiles um, from uh, single cell RNA sequencing here. Um, but what's missing uh, at this point is uh, the spatial locations of these cells. You know, we're looking at this UMAP, you can see that the cell types are very distinct, but it doesn't quite look like what we would expect as a mouse, of course. And it's um, this component that uh, motivated our project to build a highly resolved uh, spatial reference map for early organogenesis in mouse. So, uh, Tim Lohoff, uh, as part of his PhD, um, and I collaborated with the lab of Professor Longkai in uh, Caltech, um, and we performed uh, SIGFISH, sequential fluorescence in situ hybridization uh, on uh, mouse embryos at this or early organogenesis stage. So here we were able to capture the positions of individual molecules uh, corresponding to hundreds of genes um, for these cross sections um, uh, across here. So what I'm showing uh, at the moment is, uh, is uh, one of our sort of digital in situ uh, reconstructions. Um, and here we can see the top part corresponds to the head. Um, the middle part corresponds to the heart region along the side is the trunk and then uh, moving around into the tail. So from this uh, graph, uh, the colors correspond to just four genes, um, a, a subset of what we measured. Um, and we can tell already that the, the relative scales of information that we're capturing um, is quite varied. So we have the whole organism uh, captured uh, and if we zoom in, we get into the tissue level um, and uh, right down into the subcellular context. So uh, to describe the, the experiment a little bit more, um, we collected three distinct uh, embryo cross sections and we captured this uh, molecule level gene expression for a total of pro approximately 350 specially selected genes. So we used uh, an additional probe strategy um, to be able to preserve the cell boundary uh, protein signal, um, which allowed us to have uh, cell segmentation uh, be made a lot more easier um, using uh, toolboxes like uh, elastic to form segmentation. And this was independent of the local gene expression patterns. And so together that brought us to uh, the, the sort of data structures that we we're dealing with. So we have the cell segmentation as well as the mRNA uh, molecule detection, um, and then um, leading on to downstream uh, integrative analysis. Um, so the resulting data set um, contains, you know, close to 60,000 detected cells um, with an average of about 100 detected genes per cell. Um, and so looking purely at the molecular level um, uh, plotted here in space, I'm just showing different genes uh, at different points, um, we can already see that there's, you know, a remarkable level of specificity of the spatial gene expression. Um, uh, so we can see that, you know, there's, there's quite a bit going on and it is quite useful to see um, uh, this multivariate view of uh, genes in, in, in a single uh, uh, spatial context. So the, the first sort of analytical task that we had for data integration um, was to sort of characterize these genes, you know, we, uh, these cells. Um, you know, we know their transcriptional profiles for a number of important genes. Um, and we did have access to a very rich uh, dissociated data resource. So, you know, here we have quite a number of annotated cell types as well as their profiles. Um, and so, you know, our first task was to essentially be able to label uh, our spatial cells. 
And so what we did was use uh, an existing approach for data integration um, uh, designed for uh, individual experiments of single cell RNA-seq, where we adapted it to uh, this context. So here we restricted um, uh, to the intersecting genes uh, captured in single cell RNA-seq across the entire transcriptome um, and those we measured with seq fish. Um, and what we uh, we use mutual nearest neighbors to be able to uh, sort of embed them into this common space. And so what I'm showing here is a UMAP projection where each cell, uh, each point corresponds to the cells depending on which uh, data set they came from. Um, and we can note that there's a nice overlap between these. Um, and I mean, we would expect that since they came from a similar um, uh, samples. So they're together now we can, um, uh, if we if we split them apart, then you know if we go back to our uh, dissociated cells, they originally had the same labels. But what we're able to do is use uh, classical machine learning um, just to predict the cell type labels, um, uh, as well as a measure of uh, confidence associated with this. So what does that give us from our first sort of data integration task? Um, well, it allows us to uh, essentially uh, paint the, the, uh, our spatial map in terms of the cell types and in the same context, uh, using the same sort of the color palette of, of our initial um, uh, uh, study. Um, and so what we can appreciate sort of just visually is that there's quite a, a variation in the spatial distribution of particular cell types. So, you know, we can see that some uh, uh, particular colors are very uh, well mixed, they're distributed um, in, in different ways. Um, one uh, sort of little vignette that I want to um, focus on just for today um, is this uh, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain region. So this is this dark green um, sort of component up in this uh, top uh, and left uh, part here. So this cluster, um, uh, you know, it's got a, it's got a single label, but we can see that it captured it's captured over quite a large uh, space, um, and what we could uh, sort of characterize, you know, having uh, obtained these uh, groupings of our cells is to understand, you know, what level of gene expression variability can be actually attributed to space. And so this is one of the downstream analyses that we performed. Um, so what I'm showing here is a set of violin plots. The groupings correspond to these cell types um, and each point corresponds to a gene. Now the y-axis uh, corresponds to the degree of uh, transcriptional heterogeneity that is explained by the neighboring cells for a given type. Um, and so we can see that the dark green group, the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain comes up as, as quite a, a high group here, suggesting that there's still a lot of gene expression variability that can be explained by space. Um, and so what that meant for us was that, you know, we could uh, potentially be able to dissect these groups uh, a little bit in more detail than what was done in uh, just the dissociated data. Um, and what, what helped us quite a bit for this was to uh, perform uh, uh, clustering in a joint manner using the full transcriptome from the single cell RNA-seq, as well as the positions uh, of the, um, the spatial data here. So what we found were uh, key uh, sort of distinct clusters corresponding to the uh, hindbrain, the midbrain, um, and the forebrain, as well as the uh, sort of tagmentum. Now, uh, in addition to this, uh, we looked at um, one uh, sort of key uh, area of um, the brain um, and the midbrain hindbrain boundary. And the reason why is because during this um, stage in development, um, there is believed that there's a, a lot of signaling events happening. Um, and it's of interest to try to understand, you know, what's, what's, um, uh, what's, uh, corresponding to cell intrinsic sort of uh, cascading events and what is maybe a cell extrinsic. So what we were able to do by 
you know, sort of zooming into a particular sort of substructure within our um, spatial map uh, was to look at the gene expression profiles along this spatial boundary. So what we did was extract these spatial expression profiles. We used uh, diffusion uh, embedding uh, to be able to uh, place each of our cells, so each point here corresponds to a cell, um, along these diffusion components according to its gene expression. Um, and now if I uh, re-graph uh, the uh, area here um, with the colors corresponding to the diffusion component one, then we can see that uh, we're seeing a sort of symmetric uh, sort of radiating out of, of the, the most uh, transcriptionally variable component. Um, and the arrows here correspond to the uh, vectors, um, which show the direction and the magnitude of the biggest change in space. So what's sort of striking for us is that we did not use the spatial uh, component to be able to uh, extract this plot and put in these colors. Um, it's striking to us that there's such a very strong correlation between the uh, the diffusion as well as the smoothness of, of the gene expression profiles here. Um, so uh, what uh, another uh, part to this was uh, you know we've we've got this component um, now we can understand uh, you know how many uh, different types of profiles we can actually observe uh, according to this spatial group. And so we used uh, a technique called SHOT, single cell higher order testing, um, using a weighted mean. So this is a non-parametric test that essentially identifies uh, any type of variation in space. Um, and so these are the top genes that we found uh, corresponding to their uh, gene expression. We can see that there's a variation in terms of the uh, uh, regions of which we identify positive gene expression. And so, uh, I think uh, that's, that's just one component that we were able to look at um, for this study. Um, one thing that has uh, become quite clear from looking at these sort of spatial transcriptomics data sets is that there's uh, a lot of opportunity to be able to uh, interactively explore these data. And so I built a uh, shiny interactive platform um, to be able to uh, allow some sort of uh, interactive um, interrogation of these data. Um, one such interrogation that's possible is uh, selection of cells according to space. So here we are performing virtual dissections to be able to identify specific areas that may not be so easy to uh, extract um, if you're working just uh, with like uh, uh, in, in your R or in your Python um, um, ecosystem. Um, and so, yes, we can sort of look at these groups, uh, identify, you know, what, what uh, particular cell types they correspond to, as well as what their overarching gene expression signatures are. Um, and so uh, as a final outlook, um, I think the, the, the big component to this uh, study and certainly for the analysis component to it is that, you know, we were performing data integration, but we had uh, between the single cell RNA-seq and between the spatial omics, we actually had different uh, uh, amounts of information content between them. And so this problem um, actually we, we term as mosaic uh, data integration. Um, and so lately I've been uh, working on techniques to be able to perform this data integration task without compromising on these uh, information uh, that is not necessarily shared between the two. And so um, I've developed a method called StabMap um, and uh, there is a preprint coming soon. So uh, I do hope you uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and so with that, I'd like to summarize. So we uh, built a spatial reference map for mouse organogenesis, and we used data integration techniques to be able to learn more about this data. Um, and we observed a number of molecular differences in space, um, and I described uh, such in, in the brain. Um, and 
Finally, I'd like to note that I will be opening my lab uh, in a few months time. Um, I am really interested in prospective students or collaboration. So if you are interested in chatting more, please do reach out. Um, and I'd like to uh, finally acknowledge um, the wonderful team who's gone, uh, who has worked towards this project, um, as well as uh, yourselves for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I think we have time for at least one question. Um, so one question that I had is um, you, you had a, a pre-existing dissociated data set of single RNA sequencing that did not come from like the same uh, organisms that you then did uh, your seek fish on. Um, and was there any kind of technical difficulties and potential differences between like trying to integrate those kind of data sets that are collected from different samples at very different times? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And um, uh, I think for this project, we were quite um, fortunate that uh, the mouse embryo system is uh, quite well established and well studied. Um, so we're, we're sort of operating in like the, the best case that we possibly can. Um, but that being said, um, you know, we did have a, sort of a, a mid section, a sagittal section of our mouse embryo. And um, in terms of the selection of fields of view, um, you know, we are selecting sort of uh, a region of, of cells. And so what we found, um, which I think was uh, kind of validating, I guess, for us, was that we did uh, observe a, uh, a depletion of cell types that are on the left right axis and on the outside of, of the embryo. So that actually gave us a bit of a vote of confidence that our cell label transfer was um, on the right track. Great. Um, and then one more question. Can you say a little bit more about how you did the cell boundary tagging and visualization for segmentation? And like how, how hard was it to segment the cells? Did you have to like manually curate things? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the um... I think if we had not included these uh, this tertiary probe, so so a, a, a set of um, a number of proteins, so based on cadherins that are sort of are present on the cell membrane um, during uh, for for mouse embryos. Um, so I think if we had not uh, been able to capture that as uh, an individual channel. Um, we may have run into the issue of needing to kind of do a iterative process of sort of segmenting nuclei, uh, expanding uh, onto the boundaries, and then making some sort of inference on the gene expression that we would expect depending on what's close. Um, and I mean, I think that that's, you know, what you need to do if you don't have the, the signal. Um, but what's what's nice about the um, current data set is that we don't necessarily need to do that. And um, it offers a, a sort of a gold standard almost so that, you know, we could test methods that, uh, you know, don't use segmentation and then test them against and see like, okay, well, how accurate was it? Um, how safe is our assumption that, uh, you know, nearer cells or, you know, correlated um, gene expressions can be mixed together and so on. So I think it's, I think we're quite fortunate with the experimental design here. Great. Uh, thank you, Sheila, and to all of our speakers so far. Uh, we're going to take a short break and resume at 9.55 a.m. Pacific time. Thanks, everyone.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back from the break. And uh, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Um, yep. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much, and welcome back from the break. Uh, my name is Brock Roberts, and I am a scientist at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. I'm on the stem cells and gene editing team. And I'm also one of the co-chairs of the symposium planning committee. I'm a very proud co-chair. Uh, I'll be the MC for the remainder of the presentations today as we enter the home stretch of our event. Um, and uh, I would uh, like to introduce our next presenter, which is Dr. Zabina Petri. Dr. Petri is an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Associated Faculty of the departments and I lost my cue and sorry got it back and is also associated faculty in the departments of chemical and biological engineering and chemistry at Princeton University and in her lab she's tackling how the microtubule cytoskeleton builds cellular structures by combining single molecule imaging and cell biology methods with high resolution structural techniques and her titled talk her talk is titled today how to make microtubules and build the cytoskeleton Really looking forward to it and thank you very much and welcome Zabina. Thank you so much for the introduction and actually the excellent pronunciation of my first name. <laughs> uh, I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I really enjoyed um, you know, this conference so far and it has been a pleasure to learn actually a little bit more about the Allen Institute as well. Um, so my lab is interested in how the microbial cytoskeleton forms cellular structures and um, Actually, I just uh, want to make sure that I can advance the slide. Maybe just I am controlling the screen. Oh, I see it. Okay, let me try. Okay, fantastic. So we want to know how cellular structures are formed. And there are many interesting ones, uh, starting from uh, neurons that transmit action potentials, cilia that generate force for movement, and um, mitotic spindles that segregate chromosomes. And all of these structures rely on a particular microtubule architecture. For example, microtubules in a neuron are very um, you know, long and stable, whereas microtubules in the spindle are very short and dynamic. So how does the microtubule cytoskeleton build these cellular structures? And that question is really important if you understand how a cell can actually obtain its shape, how the interior of the cell is organized, how um, motor proteins can move materials along these tracks, um, and ultimately, of course, how chromosomes are being segregated. Um, now, to tell you a little bit more what I mean by this um, building process, uh, I would like to use the analogy of the Eiffel Tower. Let's say we want to build this structure, we would usually have a building plan. Um, we would um, produce all the components, and of course, we would know um, exactly their role. And then we take the components, put them together according to the building band, and build the structure. Now, for the microtubule cytoskeleton, um, thanks to genetics and uh, proteomics of the last decades, we actually have pretty much complete lists of all the components, but we can't necessarily make them all outside the cell. Um, we definitely do not understand the building plan that the cell is following, and hence we cannot build these structures ourselves. We do know quite a bit about um, the cytoskeletal framework, though, and, and these are microtubules. Uh, they're made up of the alpha, beta, tubulin dimer. Uh, these associate head to tail to form protofilaments, and then 13 of those protofilaments form the extra tube of the microtubule. Microtubules polymerize and depolymerize at their plus end, um, and they are made or nucleated at their so-called minus end. And this nucleation reaction is really the key that will determine what kind of structure is going to be built. Um, for example, you can imagine that, um, you know, where and when that nucleation uh, takes place can really determine whether you may not make now a uh, polarized epithelial cell, whether you're going to make a long axon or whether you're going to have a dividing cell. Um, so in my lab, um, we are um, interested in how the mitotic spindle is made. And the mitotic spindle orchestrates cell division. It's essential for life. Um, we see here a movie of how a spindle uh, secretes chromosomes that you kind of see uh, you know, shaded in dark here. And what we're actually zooming in on by fluorescently labeling them are microtubules. And um, you know, I want you to appreciate that you know, this is a really coordinated process. In human cell, you have to secrete 46 chromosomes at once. It's pretty fast. It happens in you know, roughly half an hour. And it's incredibly error-free. Um, so by the time you're 70 years old, your body will have gone at least um, 1,000 trillion successful cell divisions. It's also been well studied. We know uh, about it for roughly 130 years. 
So what is there possibly that we don't understand yet? And so one of the major limitations is that um, we're still not able to actually individually resolve microtubules in the spindle, uh, presumably because the density of microtubules is very high and it's a very uh, you know, large three-dimensional structure. So in this movie, we can all agree that there are fluorescently labeled microtubules, but there are often hundreds of thousands of them. And so if we don't understand exactly where these building blocks are made and how they are moved, we actually cannot really explain how that structure is made and how it functions. So I'm going to come back to that limitation. Of course, again, we know quite a bit about the spindle. We do know that um, all these microtubules in the spindle depicted here in gray come from certain locations um, through certain pathways, nucleation pathways. So microtubules are made at the centrosome. They're also made actually at chromosomes. And then most recently we learned that microtubules can actually branch um, and thereby regenerate themselves. And that's what we call branching microtubule nucleation. And uh, that is a pathway that I was involved in discovering together with Ron Bale and Tim Mitchison. So um, branching microtubule nucleation is important to make the majority of microtubules within the spindle. And if we don't have this branching, we essentially lack microtubules in the spindle center. Um, the kinetical fiber is weakened and it cannot exert as much force on sister kinetochores. And actually a human cell cannot successfully complete cell division without these microtubules via branching. Um, so how come that we only learned about this pathway in 2013? Um, well, uh, we partly overcame this limitation of resolving individ individual microtubules. And the trick was to actually not look in the cell per se, but to use cell extract. And we do that in the lab by using meiotic egg extract from Xenopus levis, where we can isolate the cell arrested extract and then supply back a form of, of chromosomes or chromatin beads to recapitulate a spindle. Now that system already existed for decades, but what we did is we looked at it by total internal reflection microscopy, which gives you a really high signal to noise ratio close to the glass cover slip. And when we did this, uh, we could actually see, oh, the movie is not playing. Um, this movie is not playing, but I'll have more movies to come. I basically want you to appreciate that what you're seeing is not a single microtubule, but you see a bunch of them. They look kind of like trees, fireworks, and that really visualized branching. So we know that this is happening inside the spindle. All right, so with this system set up and the ability to actually zoom into a single microtubule nucleation pathway of the spindle, um, my lab um, started a, a new approach, which is to actually not look uh, at spindle assembly in the cell, but to actually try to, spindle, uh, to build the spindle from scratch. And so our plan was to first understand how does the cell actually make the microtubule framework? And if we can make microtubules, then we can ask what other proteins do we actually need and what are their functions to make the spindle? And with a few of those at hand, the idea was that we could actually start to build a substructure just to have something tangible and not just build the whole spin at once. Um, once we can build a substructure, we could actually decipher the building plan. And if we did this now with the most important substructures of the spindle, the idea was that we could take them like pieces of the puzzle and plug them together and thereby really rationalize how the spindle is made. And so I'm gonna give you, um, you know, a brief overview of how we got to this point number four and an outlook of what we're going to do next. So the first task was to understand how does a cell make, make microtubules? And the big question is, um, you know, how are these alpha beta tubular dimers added onto one another to actually make this microtubule tube? There uh, was a, a universal microtubule nucleator that was known. It's called the gamma tubulin ring complex or gamma turk. It has a ring shape that roughly matches the diameter of a microtubule, but we really didn't understand you know, how it works. And so the question was really, okay, what is this transition state? Um, uh, how can we explain how we go from this state to here? And so what we developed is a single molecule assay where we can just look at individual nucleators making the microtubule life. Um, we were able to purify these ring complexes, attach them to glass, put those in a cover slab, and then flow in fluorescent labeled tubulin. And when we do that, um, we can see that microtubules nucleate specifically from these attached nucleators. Now, I'm not gonna show you more data. I just want to summarize that we did kinetics uh, combined with modeling and then came up with, um, with the following model. Um, so the idea is that these alpha beta tubulin subunits actually bind with very high affinity to gamma tubulin. Um, and this ring is uh, then still in, uh, in an open structure where the diameter is too wide uh, for the microtubule to match. But then if you have about four of these tubulin dimers that bind one uh, next to one another, 
you actually create enough um, lateral interactions between them and thereby enough free energy that then um, uh, you can overcome this transition state and close the gamma tubulin ring subunit. And if you then do that, um, this, uh, this ring uh, is then able to actually uh, switch from the nucleation state into the polymerization state where the microtubule can simply grow. So that's our quantity understanding of, of how this nucleation reaction happens on this gamma tubulin ring complex. Um, but in addition, uh, it was actually an open question whether there are additional nucleators. And so it turns out uh, there actually is. Um, so we, um, we uh, together with others in parallel, have actually discovered that there's another molecule called XMAP215 in Cenopus. Um, it's an elongated molecule that is just as important as that ring complex. And it, they work together synergistically. Uh, and the way the work is kind of depicted here, um, they bind to one another. And um, whereas the ring complex is again uh, responsible for providing the template to assemble the tubulin subunits, uh, this elongated XMAP molecule essentially acts like an arm that very specifically binds tubulin dimers and can essentially bring them in um, onto the growing microtubule. Okay, so this is the summary of how we currently understand nucleation, and it really brought us into the position where we can now efficiently make a microtubule in vitro. So how do we go from here to actually making the spindle? And so the next step is to really try to make um, one of these pathways um, happen and, and thereby understand it again. And so again, to remind you, we have the centrosomal pathway, we have microtubules originating from chromosomes, and we have branching. And it's the branching pathway that we focused on because we could already isolate it in that extract. Um, so for this branching pathway, I want to give you a little bit more information. It's actually activated at chromosomes themselves via the small GTPase RAN. And RAN releases so-called spindle assembly factors, one of which is TPX2, that's usually sequestered by impotence. But once it's released and we actually were to take this protein purified and add it to extract, that's when we actually turn on the branching. Okay, and so this movie is now working. So in red, you see microtubules. In green, you see the growing microtubule plus ends. And when this movie plays, I want replays, I want you to appreciate that we started with a single microtubule now. And from this single microtubule, more microtubules keep on nucleating and branching. Um, you can see that this uh, is uh, happening in a very shallow angle. Um, and so this is actually the perfect mechanism to rapidly amplify microtubules if you want to make a parallel bundle as you need in the spindle. Now, if we don't have this DPX2 protein um, or another protein complex called Argmin, you still make a microtubule and you polymerize it, but you no longer branch. So we have identified those as specific branching factors, and I'm gonna come back to them. And then as I just told you, if you don't have one of the nucleators, not a single microtubule forms. All right, so, um, so we already know that um, this uh, nucleator has to be brought to the side of the mother microtubule to create that branch site. But how do we get it there? And how is it turned on right at spindle assembly? And so that's where we figured we probably need a localizing molecule and probably some kind of activator. Now for the localization function, um, there had already been pretty good cell biological evidence from other labs that um, it's probably this protein complex called Argmin. Um, we showed that it looks like the letter H and has actually two, two tetrameric domains, one that binds on the microtubule, one that provides a binding site for this ring complex. And so it really acts as a bridge to bring the ring complex there. Okay, great. So now the nucleator is there, but how does it get turned on? And so now we turn our attention to this protein TPX2. And I have to admit that I actually didn't care about it as much because it was very small compared to these big complexes. It's only 70 kilodalton. Um, and nothing was really known about it, or at least I should say very little. So we did um, a first a set of structural analysis where we simply just looked at the secondary structure. We identified alpha helical domains in its C-terminal half. And actually turns out if we just take that C-terminal half and again add it to that extract, we can turn on these fireworks. And we identified bioinformatically that there's an activation motif in there. So first thought, okay, now we have this figured out. We have the localizer, we have the activator, but we forgot about this very important N-terminus. You can already see in this plot that it's intrinsically disordered. And of course, it turns out to form one of these liquid-liquid phase separations. Uh, it essentially makes droplets that fuse in vitro. And when you pipette them onto a cover slip, they essentially wet it uh, just like a liquid. All right, so um, of course, we had already now many of these uh, you know, droplets that you can make in vitro. But the real question is, what do they actually do? And so. Um, 
The first thing that we hypothesize is maybe this TPX2 droplet can bind tubulin, um, but the monomeric form actually cannot, and that had been confirmed by many other labs. But it turns out if you now have the TPX2 droplet, it actually forms a co-condensate with tubulin. If we now take these TPX2 droplets and we actually put them in the extract, they still recruit the tubulin, they make microtubules, and these microtubules can also branch. There was only one problem, which is that unless we added the droplets, we could actually not see them. So at first, actually, it seemed like an artifact. But what we could see is that the TPX2 is always localized to microtubules. So we thought something special has to be happening on that microtubule. Uh, we can again zoom in on that in vitro, where we can have a stabilized microtubule. And I want you to focus on this movie, where we now see how TPX2 binds to it. So it first coats the microtubule and then breaks up into droplets. And these droplets can even fuse. The other cool thing is that um, these droplets on the microtubule can still recruit tubulin. And so now just to summarize this data, uh, what this means is that TPX2 again forms droplets on the microtubule lattice and recruits tubulin, the substrate of nucleation. So that brings us already a little bit closer to understanding how it can possibly nucleate there. Um, but what is the role of this n terminal half um, uh, of TPX2 that's so intrinsically disordered? Well, this half alone actually does not cause any branching per se. Whereas that C terminal half, as I already told you, is the minimal domain that turns on these fireworks. If we now have both halves in the endogenous protein, the wild type protein, um, we again, of course, turn on the branching, but we do it at a much lower concentration. And then you know, we can quantify that. Um, and there's actually a tenfold um, uh, kinetic efficiency difference between the minimal construct and the, the wild type protein. So what is this due to? Is this due to the phase separation? Is this due to the ability to uh, recruit tubulin or possibly both? And to address this, we actually made uh, chimeric molecules where we always have this minimal active C terminus but then add on um, heterologous regions with different functions. So they can either only bind tubulin or only phase separate or do both. And it turns out that you indeed need both. You need the ability to phase separate and the ability to bind tubulin in order for this reaction to proceed at the full level. And so this uh, was exciting for us to explain a little bit more how branching works, uh, but we think it was actually also quite important for the phase separation field where it had been postulated that uh, condensation can enhance reaction kinetics. Uh, and here we had a very nice example where we can show, show this with one protein and this one reaction by directly visualizing it and actually to show it in a physiological environment. So, um, okay, this TPX2 definitely is a very intriguing molecule. Um, traditional structural methods unfortunately don't work with it because when you crystallize it, you get phase separation. Um, with EM, everything is disordered. And so we actually turned to atomic force microscopy. And this was a project that we started with a physiology course in Woods Hole. We want to essentially just probe the molecule and see, you know, what does it feel like? What is its topology? Or was it, what is its stiffness? What is the height of this layer? And um, this is what the data collection looks like. You see a naked microtubule. We then flow in the TPX2. And you cannot blink now for 30 seconds. Look at this. When we flow it in, there's a sudden increase in the diameter of the microtubule. And then there's actually some rearrangement or some structure that has, happens here. Now, if we scan this um, many times, and this is hundreds of times, we can get um, very reproducible data. Um, first of all, the diameter of the microtubule is 25 nanometers. So that's the control. When TPX2 is added, it initially forms a layer of 50 nanometer diameter. But then over the course of an hour in red, you can see that it shifts into this uh, peak layer distribution. And again, taking hundreds of these scans and averaging them uh, and taking the power spectrum, you can see that we get an emergent periodicity um, of roughly 260 nanometers within an hour. Um, so what this means is um, that a TPX2 really forms regularly spaced droplets on that microtubule, and we confirm this is also true with another method. This is using negative stain EM. And so when um, we looked at this, it was also clear that, okay, this is happening also by fluorescence microscopy, so we really want to make sure that this is not a measurement artifact. And in fact, we can also see these branch sites coming from these droplets. So when I showed this to our collaborator, Howard Stone, he looked at this and he thought, oh my gosh, Sabina, that looks like the Rayleigh Plateau instability. I have to admit that at that point, I did not know what that was, but essentially it is the theory that describes of how a fluid um, breaks up into droplets. 
And you can think about that if you turn on the faucet. And so a joint a student of ours, Bernardo de Gueva, took this on and he essentially took um, you know, this periodicity and um, the height of the layer and then essentially calculated whether this is indeed true. And it turns out that yes, TPEX2 forms uh, droplets according to this instability. So um, one prediction that you can make by this theory is the following. Um, so yeah, thicker films should make bigger droplets that are further spaced apart. And you can see that here visually, I think very nicely. If we have a thin film, you make smaller droplets that are closely spaced together. And that's given by this ideal relationship here. So can we test that again experimentally to really make sure that our theory is also correct? And it turns out we can. We can actually alter the film thickness by simply increasing the concentration of TPX2. And when we do that, we indeed also increase the droplet spacing. Um, so what uh, are these droplets good for and why is a film not there? And so we postulated, well, maybe that um, these droplets help enhance the efficiency of branching. And that could be the case because we already do know that multiple factors have to come together in one spot to make this reaction happening. And Bernardo then simulated that. He asked, um, you know, how long does it take for multiple components to come together in a film versus droplets? And it indeed turns out that in a droplet, you can concentrate these factors faster. And so we do think that this could be one of the reasons why these droplets are helpful in the cell. So just to summarize this part, um, so we've essentially shown by multiple methods that TPEX2 organizes on microtubules just like a fluid. Again, this is the same theory that also describes how droplets form on a spider web. Um, this, we think, is the first demonstration of this Rayleigh plateau instability um, in molecular biology. Uh, we believe it will probably also apply to other microtubule binding proteins probably also to proteins that bind to other cellular filaments, if you think about DNA, RNA, or the interplastic reticulum. So um, I've told you now quite a bit about the individual components, but the question is, can we now understand that pathway of branching? And the ultimate way to actually understand it is um, to reconstitute it in vitro. Uh, so we were able to actually make all these components um, in vitro and reconstitute them. I should say that uh, even though there are only three complexes, it's a total of 45 proteins and it took about a decade to get this to work. Uh, so this was really a tour de force. Um, uh, it's just this brief summary slide. So we have the mother microtuber in green that we can stabilize in vitro. We now have all of these components bound to the microtubule that we verified are there. And the question now is what will happen? Um, in red, you already see that the polymerization reaction is proceeding. And again, that's the easiest reaction to happen. And then if I play this, I basically want you to appreciate that these complexes indeed nucleate new microtubules from the side of this pre-existing microtubule. And with this, we actually um, you know, have gained now a deeper understanding of how that reaction works. Um, this is the summary. We have the mother microtubule um, to which, uh, again, this TPX2 protein binds and makes these droplets. From here, TPX2 actually recruits um, the bridge, uh, Augmin, that then recruits the nucleator Gamma Turk. Uh, TPX2 itself can actually also recruit a little bit of the nucleator. And then TPX2 also recruits the substrate of nucleation. And so this is our current understanding of how this pathway happens. Um, now going forward, okay, this is basically the substructure that we now built. Um, we now, of course, want to understand a little bit more about the other substructures, and those include uh, the nucleation center from the centrosome and what exactly is happening at the chromosomes. And we're now at an exciting point where we actually start to understand enough of these pieces of the puzzle and can start to put them together according to the principle, you can only build what you understand. And so with this, I would like to um, finish by acknowledging, again, people who did the work. Uh, so Akanksha Tavani and Rachel Kajik were actually um, you know, the tour de force on figuring out how the nucleator works. Matt King explored uh, this initial phase separation, and he was then followed by Bernardo and Saga, who uh, tag teamed on the atomic force microscopy of the liquid droplets. And then I want to point out also Rea Farroako, who um, actually did this massive reconstitution. Um, I would like to acknowledge collaborators, in particular Howard Stone, he's in engineering in, in, at Princeton, and Josh Shevitz, he's in physics at Princeton, and we have several co-mentored um, trainees. And again, I, I thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Sabina. That was outstanding. Thank you. That was, that was towering. <laughs> um, are you going to read out the questions? Yes. Um, 
we have time. We're a little bit over. But I think we have time for one question. Why don't I ask uh, the first one? Um, how specific are these mechanisms to um, to to spindle regulation? And uh, maybe another interesting question that, that I can't get off my mind but looking at this is, does the condensate uh, contribute potentially to, to trafficking and loading of microtubules or other, other mechanisms beyond just making the branching? Okay, uh, good. Okay, so, wait, so uh, remind me again, what was the first one? How, how specific are these mechanisms to uh, spindle regulation or do, do you also have branching in other parts of the cell cycle? I see, I see, I see. Okay, that is a great question. So um, so let's see, um, the branching was actually also first discovered in plants in interface where it's actually happening at the cell cortex. And um, there you actually have a very intricate interaction network between the cortex and microtubules, so a plant interface. Um, a form of branching had been observed in yeast cells, but that happens actually anti-parallel. So ours is parallel, that's anti-parallel. Um, but then, uh, you know, pretty unique is this uh, branching in the spindles, and that actually also happens in, um, you know, in the plant spindle as well. Um, meanwhile, it has also been discovered in the neuron axon. And so I would uh, pretty much bet that there must be other sites where this is happening in the cell. And I think really great locations to look is wherever you have parallel bundle of microtubules. So I think uh, the jury is still out where else this is happening. And then uh, you ask about these, uh, these uh, TPX2 droplets and whether they can mediate anything else. Um, correct me if I didn't understand your question correctly, um, but essentially said, you know, can it help with anything else like trafficking or so? Um, we currently don't know. You know, I think uh, you know, it's pretty new that these droplets, you know, now not only form in solution, but they also form on surfaces. Um, I think it would be very intriguing to understand, you know, how do motors behave with them? Uh, do they walk through them? Uh, are they getting stuck there? Again, you know, TPX2 is probably concentrating many other things there. We, we don't have a complete list of what is in these droplets. And um, I think it's still also an interesting question out there whether these droplets remain static or whether they can potentially also be moved. Because we do know that this branching activity, even though it originates at the chromosomes, has to be distributed throughout the whole spindle. And of course, we do have some poleward flux that automatically moves microtubules to the pole, but there could possibly also be some active transport, which would be pretty cool. So I do think this is really only the starting point of understanding what, um, what these droplets do and how, how their location and formation is regulated. Okay, outstanding. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're gonna keep the uh, ball rolling here and move on to our next talk. Uh, thank you very much, Sabina. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Matt Akamatsu. And so uh, very excited about this. Matt uh, has completed postdoctoral work at UC Berkeley in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology uh, with uh, David Druben and Georgiana Barnes. Uh, very soon in June of this year, he will be joining the faculty at the University of Washington in the Department of Biology uh, in Seattle along with us. So we're very excited about that. Uh, Matt's lab will combine mathematical modeling, human stem cell genome editing, and fluorescence microscopy to study the mechanical relationship between the actin cytoskeleton and membrane deformation during mammalian endocytosis. Today, he will be giving a talk with the following title, Self-Organization and Load Adaptation by Endocytic Actin Networks. So thank you very much and welcome, Matt. Thanks a lot, Brock. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Matt Akamatsu. I'm just finishing my postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, and I'm moving to the University of Washington over the summer, where I'll be combining computational modeling with live cell fluorescence imaging in order to understand how the actin cytoskeleton produces force during mammalian endocytosis. The work that I'll show today is the result of a collaboration across several researchers housed in a couple of labs, namely Padmini Rangamani's lab at UC San Diego, and David Drubin's lab at UC Berkeley. In this network diagram, each line represents a regular interaction that has occurred during the pandemic between researchers, primarily over Slack and Zoom. And this resulted in a number of integrated projects that ranged in techniques from theory to modeling to live cell fluorescence imaging, biochemistry, and cryo-electron tomography, which has been very satisfying in allowing us to steer our projects towards molecular mechanisms of cytoskeletal complexes in cells. 
We study the biophysical mechanism by which the actin cytoskeleton deforms cellular membranes. Put more broadly, Paul Allen reportedly asked the cell biology community, what is the operating system of the cell? And I think this is a question that we still do not have the answer to. And in particular, if this living cell shown under a lattice light sheet microscope is composed of protein complexes and membranes, what are some of the principles that allow these non-living components to get together under the influence of Brownian motion in order to create this living adapting cell? And we focus on the interaction between the cytoskeleton and cellular membranes as a more tractable problem housed underneath this broader question for the field of cell biology. And most of those shape changes observed in that movie are driven by the polymerization of actin filaments, which is schematized in this cartoon of a cell. Actin filaments can produce force against a membrane by polymerizing, adding subunits onto one end, therefore advancing the position of the membrane. And flexible actin filaments can produce more force if the ARP23 complex binds to the side of a pre-existing actin filament and nucleates the growth of a new daughter filament at a defined angle therefore creating a polarized branched actin filament. And these polarized arrays of filaments can advance the position of the membrane more efficiently. And the role of these branched filaments is best understood in the context of cell migration, where the membrane is essentially flat on the length scale of an individual branch. But equally important are the role of these branched filaments in membrane trafficking processes, both in the cell interior and on the periphery of the cell in which these filaments have the job of needing to deform a continuously bending substrate that changes its topology over time. It somehow needs to bind two different pieces of the membrane to stretch one piece away from the other and change its topology so that the membrane can be transported from one part of the cell to the other. And it's much less well understood how the actin cytoskeleton could achieve such a feat. And we use clathrin mediated endocytosis as a representative of all of the membrane trafficking processes that use branched actin cytoskeleton to deform their membranes. So during clathrin mediated endocytosis, the cell's plasma membrane is deformed from a flat sheet into a spherical vesicle over the course of about a minute in order to internalize transmembrane proteins and extracellular material. In mammalian cells, the plasma membrane is under tension and this serves as a source of resistance to those shape changes. And so a host of cellular proteins, including the clathrin coat and components of the branched actin cytoskeleton will collectively pull and pinch on the plasma membrane until a neck forms, at which point curvature sensing GTPases will wrap around the neck of the pit and create this endocytic vesicle that'll get delivered down somewhere into the interior of the cell. When membrane tension is high, the polymerization of actin filaments is required for the shape change from the U-shaped intermediate to this late stage pinch shape. But we still know very little about the mechanism of action by which these diffusing polarized branched actin filaments can organize in order to produce directional force in a manner that advances endocytosis. So our main questions are, what is the molecular mechanism by which these actin networks organize to produce directional force at sites of mammalian endocytosis? And how do they cope with a stochastic environment of cells in which the membrane tension is fluctuating, sources of resistance, geometry is changing over time, how can the network ensure that endocytosis proceeds in a variable environment? And we think that these two principles of self-assembly and load adaptation should apply more broadly to other cytoskeletal systems that are producing force on cellular membranes. We choose clathrin mediated endocytosis because enough of the components have been identified and measured in order for us to set up simple computational models that allow us to propose and test mechanistic hypotheses. So for example, the proteins that activate the ARP23 complex and their activators tend to reside in a ring around the base of the endocytic pit, whereas the proteins that link actin filaments to the clathrin coat tend to be embedded in the curved clathrin coat. And I reason that these two spatial constraints combined with knowledge of the structures rates of interactions, and numbers of molecules of key actin binding proteins at sites of endocytosis would allow me to set up a computational model and run simulations to test hypotheses by comparing 
the outputs of the simulations with high resolution microscopy methods. In other words, we're using simple biophysical models as the platform to integrate quantitative data from a variety of sources, ranging from structural biology to biochemistry to live cell fluorescence imaging to cryo-electron tomography. And we pull out what we think are the most salient measurements from each of those platforms, put them together, see if they're consistent, and if they inform the model. And this running simulations helps us identify what next measurements we need to make that will be most informative of the mechanism. And comparing discrepancies between the simulations and the experiments allows us to also revisit the basic assumptions in the model so that it becomes more predictive and gives us more surprises about what the mechanism of action may be. And by iterating between the modeling and the experiments, we're steering the project towards plausible and experimentally testable new mechanisms of action for these force producing processes. So in this model, we include the minimal actin machinery required to carry out endocytosis. So this includes the ARP23 complex, which is pre-activated in a ring around the base of the endocytic pit, and actin linking proteins, which are embedded in the curved clathrin coat. Here, the endocytic pit itself is modeled simply as a solid object, which resists internalization elastically, as though it's attached to the rest of the membrane by a spring. And finally, actin filaments can bind and unbind the clathrin coat, grow, diffuse, become stochastically capped. And if they happen to encounter a pre-activated ARP23 complex up at the base of the pit, will nucleate the growth of a new branched actin filament at a defined angle. And we use Brownian dynamic simulation engines in order to run 3D stochastic simulations of this model. The key features of this type of modeling are that it's agent-based, meaning that we are modeling the individual actin filaments and protein complexes uh, and giving them rules for how they interact with each other, uh, should they be in proximity of each other. And second, that it's stochastic, meaning that there's a probability associated with each interaction and all of the molecules are subject to diffusion by Brownian motion. We're lucky in both the fields of actin cytoskeleton and clathrin mediated endocytosis, and that most of the parameters needed to constrain this model and make it predictive are well constrained or have already been measured experimentally, uh, both in biochemistry and by cell biology. And any measurements that we don't have, uh, we, we carry out uh, in, in the lab and, uh, or we run parameter simulation uh, variations to see if they're important. So then we run 3D stochastic simulations, uh, which I'll show using the Allen Institute's Simularium Viewer, uh, which has given us much more access to be able to share these simulations with members uh, of the lab, collaborators, audience members and talks, and has spurred a lot of new mechanistic hypotheses just by looking at the outcome of the simulations. So here we're looking at the inside of the cell. Here's an active ARP23 complex. Here is an actin linking protein, and these are seed actin filaments that can nucleate the growth of new branched actin filaments. So as we run this simulation, you will see that from an initially disorganized array of actin filaments, the network will gradually self-organize into a radially focused branched array that wedges between the base of the pit and the curved clathrin coat and drives the endocytic pit inward against physiologically calibrated values of plasma membrane tension. If you look at the organization of these filaments, the filaments that end up doing the most work, which are near the base of the pit, tend to be oriented not randomly, but rather parallel to the plasma membrane or directly facing, pointing towards the plasma membrane. Um, so this is evidence of this emergent organization that has occurred. So what might the mechanism of the self-organization be? Uh, we believe that it's due to a process of stochastic binding and selection. Namely, imagine two actin filaments that are binding and unbinding the endocytic pit and growing in random directions. This filament that is growing away from the base of the pit doesn't do very much, but this filament, which grows towards the base of the pit, encounters active ARP23 complex and nucleates the growth of a new branch, which creates another branch, creating a positive feedback loop for more and more branches that are best oriented to be producing force at this endocytic site. 
this stochastic binding and selection mechanism means that every endocytic actin network can be individually tailored based on the geometric and mechanical context it finds itself in and can adaptively nucleate new filaments depending on how much tension is present in the membrane and where exactly the activators of the ARP23 complex are. And so this means that the heterogeneous network of actin uh, filaments that we see in, in sites of endocytosis can be explained by the stochastic selection mechanism. So the next surprise from the simulations was that rather than growing directly into the base of the pit, these actin filaments often bent between their attachment sites in the coat and the base of the pit, which I thought might be a new way for these filaments to be producing force at sites of endocytosis. And this prediction of bent actin filaments remained an untested prediction until Daniel Servas, a postdoc, joined the lab and started doing cryo-electron tomography of intact mammalian cells that he grows on electron microscopy grids, flash freezes, and then puts under an electron microscope. And his tomograms beautifully show individual endocytic sites and all of the actin filaments surrounding them. So as we scan in Z through this tomogram, we can observe for this particular site of endocytosis, indeed, long actin filaments bent between their attachment sites in the coat and the base of the pit. In order to understand the mechanistic and mechanical role of these bent actin filaments, I went back to the simulations and plotted in this plot of energy over time, the amount of elastic energy that is stored in bent actin filaments over time, and compared that to how much energy is required to internalize endocytic pits in the first place, which shows that there's at least enough elastic energy stored in these bent actin filaments to carry out endocytosis. Put another way, these bent actin filaments operate like the pole of a pole vaulter, which stores elastic energy that gets released as the pole is straightened to produce directional force. And in this case, the directional force can be used over time during the course of endocytosis under the influence of Brownian motion to gradually ratchet the pit inward against membrane tension. So this integrated approach combining modeling and experiments has led to a steady stream of mechanistic insights about how various components of the actin cytoskeleton deform the endocytic membrane. And today I'll focus on the importance of the location of these actin linkers in setting up this architecture. In particular, the linkers uh, are, turn out to be the most important determinant rather than the location of the nucleating proteins. So to interrogate this question in silico, I varied the location of these linking proteins, either concentrating them at the, a tip, the tip of the pit or distributing them more broadly around the clathrin coat and ran simulations, which show a more general result, namely that as the coat is distributed more broadly around the pit. The filaments can wrap around the pit, grow into the base of the pit, and nucleate more actin filaments to produce more force. After we ran this simulation, Daniel started looking into his tomograms for evidence of these linkers being present at sites of endocytosis. And in particular, we were looking for this long coiled coiled dimer called HIP1R, which has a membrane binding domain and an actin binding domain. And indeed, he can see directly in his tomograms evidence for long dimeric coiled coil molecules that closely resemble this HIP1R molecule. So here he segmented the actin filaments, the membrane, the clathrin coat, and these putative HIP1R linkers, which are present both in the clathrin coat. So here we're looking at the clathrin coat and this long coiled coiled dimer poking out through it, and up at the neck of the pit. So here's the neck of the membrane, here is the coiled coiled dimer, and it's even interacting with a putative actin filament. So we were curious what the mechanistic role would be of these linkers that are way up in the neck of the pit. So earlier in the pandemic, I trained a computer science undergraduate, Karthik Vigesna, in an entirely remote project in which he added HIP1R linkers to the neck of the pit, ran simulations, and looked at what happened. And he found that the addition of these linkers in the endocytic pit gave the actin filaments more purchase so that they can produce more force and have more leverage and drive the endocytic pit inwards. And the filaments even start to wrap towards the neck of the pit where they might be producing 
some force in the orthogonal direction as in the first compared to the first set of simulations. And that's quantified in this plot of how far the pits internalize over time with or without these hip one r linkers at the neck. And so that shows that there's about a 50% improvement in how much force the endocytic uh, actin network can produce if there are additional linkers at the neck. And so this allows us to start thinking of the actin network as a polymerization engine constrained by two spatial boundary conditions, the second of which is the location of these linkers. So in summary, today I showed that a minimal actin network is sufficient to produce force to internalize endocytic pits against physiologically calibrated values of plasma membrane tension. They self-organize into a radially focused branched array, which wedges between the curved clathrin coat and the base of the pit, polymerizing towards the base of the pit to drive the pit inward. This self-organization is primarily determined by the distribution and location of these actin linking proteins in the curved clathrin coat and up at the neck. And finally, actin filaments based on their stiffness can bend to store elastic energy, which can be used over the course of endocytosis to ratchet the pit inward against membrane tension and allow the nucleation of new actin filaments if the pit stalls under higher resistance and higher membrane tension. And so these two properties of self-organization and load adaptation should allow the actin network to persist under the variety of mechanical and geometrical constraints that we subject it to in our cells and tissues. Now, I propose to continue this type of work at the University of Washington, where I'll be initially focusing on the reciprocal relationship between clathrin independent endocytosis and recycling from the early endosome, both of which use branched actin and presumably are in some kind of mechanical homeostasis, which we intend to elucidate. And I'll be continuing to work with members of the Allen Institute for Cell Science, first on multi-scale modeling, combining models that uh, model the uh, individual actin filaments compared to active monomers, which Joe mentioned yesterday, uh, in order to understand the relationship between bending and twisting actin filaments at sites of endocytosis. On the experimental side of uh, the lab, we're going to be working closely with Brock's team in order to continue improving our genome editing methods to endogenously GFP tag our favorite proteins of interest in human-induced pluripotent stem cells with the goal of democ democratizing the process so that more of us can tag more of our favorite proteins uh, and image them with endogenous GFP tags. We'll use them to count the numbers of molecules using a fluorescence-based molecule counting approach that I developed in the other half of my postdoc. We're going to try to coordinate these projects using open source project management tools like GitHub projects. And we also intend to micro publish many of our research results in a way that allows for us to share our results more rapidly with the scientific community, allows us to uh, coordinate collective projects more uh, efficiently uh, and to more accurately attribute credit to the people who are doing the work. And if this sounds like an environment that is of interest to you, particularly as a lab manager, uh, please send me an email. And thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to addressing questions. Thank you, Matt. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, a very nice branch out from the previous talk as well, uh, pun intended, sorry. Um, that was very, very, very interesting. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, first one is from Sharon Endow. And Sharon would like to know if you have an estimate of the absolute forces at play in these simulations or in, in, in these experiments. Yeah, and so we use membrane mechanics modeling um, as well as some uh, direct force measurements in order to estimate how much, how much force is required. So in mammalian endocytosis, it's on the scale of 15 piconewtons. For yeast endocytosis, the number is more like two or 3,000 piconewtons. And this is due to the turgor pressure of, uh, of the cytoplasm. And so the, um, the organization of the actin network, network is quite different in these two model systems. Wonderful. Um, and uh, another question from Michael Chang uh, regarding how might your hypotheses uh, approach and um, uh, overall outlook on, on this on these mechanisms apply to exocytosis. So flipping the whole thing around. 
for membrane mechanics modeling, which is primarily done in collaboration with Pedmini Rangamani's lab, we or they have started running these simulations in reverse and modeling exocytosis rather than endocytosis. Um, so the models are well suited for that. And ultimately, we want to start working towards a whole cell model that integrates, let's say you endocytose a lot of membrane, you change the membrane tension globally, that will influence the probability of exocytosis happening. And so this hom mechanical homeostasis is likely regulated by the global membrane tension, either within organelles or on the, the positive membrane. Mm -hmm. And a final quick question I think relates from Maggie Fuqua, which is um, if you're reversing endocytosis uh, or exocytosis perhaps, would you anticipate that actin filament bending in the opposite direction plays a role? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a big mystery about what role, particularly the actin cortex is having in both of these processes. So it has a mesh size that is smaller often than what the size that you need to create a, a membrane bud. Uh, and so with the case of exocytosis, it's the pre-existing actin filaments that aren't nucleated that are either getting in the way or contributing to exocytosis. And I think we don't, we don't know the answer to that yet, but we could simulate it. Okay, wonderful. Well, yeah, that was very exciting. Um, as you mentioned, very excited to, to bring you up to Seattle and continue, uh, some of, continue with some of this work, maybe together. So um, thank you very much, Matt, for your talk and for your stimulating answers uh, to those questions. Yeah, that was great. And um, I am excited now to turn us to our next talk, uh, which is from a team of researchers here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And uh, this is going to be our nuclear morphogenesis team or nuke morph, sometimes we call it. And so um, the setup for this is that the Allen Institute, of course, uh, seeks to understand cell structure in a dynamic way uh, with both breadth and depth and so we've sort of broadly and systematically done a lot of cell-wide labeling and initiated study of many organelles and cell compartments. Uh, but then on the, on the, on the depth side, the, the, the deepest work we've done to date has been on nuclear growth and nuclear shape dynamics. And uh, that's the nuclear morphogenesis team. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, members of that team now. And our first speaker, on that team is going to be Philip Sluzewski. So I'll turn it over to you now, Philip. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Brox. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Philip Sluzewski, and uh, I'm a scientific data engineer with the ASI development team. And thank you for coming to our talk on exploring mechanisms in nuclear shape and growth dynamics in HIPSC via integrated image analysis. I'll be starting this presentation talking about the data acquisition for this project. And in the second half, you'll be hearing from my coworker, Nivedithya, about our findings. At the Allen Institute, we are interested in how we can use images of cells to understand and predict their behaviors. By looking at a cell structure, we want to understand not only what it is doing, but what it did do and what it will do, relying on the deep connection between a cell's organization and its behavior or function and its event eventual identity or fate. Key to our understanding of this connection is the consideration of how the cell's organization changes with time. In the past, we've taken a detailed look at a wide variety of cellular structures in the human stem cells from snapshot images. Now we want to understand how the morphologies of these structures change together in time. And to start moving towards this, we have developed a pipeline of image processing and quantitative analysis to characterize how the growth and shape of these single structures change over time. We started, we've chosen to start with the, nucle the nucleus both because of its importance, uh, both because it's an important structure that dominates the space inside of the cell and because of the tractability of imaging and analyzing it. This leads us to begin our study of cellular organization over time by asking how these cells control the robust growth and dynamic shape changes of the nucleus during colony growth. We can do that using videos like this one 
where we follow the nuclear envelope imaged in 3D over multiple days of colony growth. Videos like this are rich with data, but extracting and harnessing that data for analysis is computationally demanding. We have over 30 of these videos following colony growth over time, with frames taken every five minutes over the course of two days and over 500 nuclei in each of these frames, we have over eight and a half million nuclei to segment and track. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you a bit about how we did this. Here we have an outline of the data generation pipeline we are using to analyze these videos. The general process is as follows. We are starting off with 20x fields of view of Laman B1 imaged in 3D for 48 hours. We first use a deep learning based model that we call the transfer function to upscale these images to 100x resolution to improve image quality and segmentation results. Next, we segment the individual nuclei in each frame through a combination of deep learning methods. And finally, we use a tracking algorithm in order to match the nuclei from one frame to the next allowing us to track individual nuclei in a time lapse as they grow and migrate. With this tracking and segmentation, we are able to start analyzing features like shape and growth of the nuclei to start painting a picture of nuclear morphogenesis. And here is a video that is a, a visualization of our final tracking results for the first video processed with this workflow. Each nucleus is outlined in a single color, and you can see its previous locations with the trailing white line. Later, Nivi will be telling you about how this video has already been giving us some interesting biological insights. But first, we will be going into, de into the details of our workflow, starting with our image acquisition. Uh, we imaged uh, these cells in 20x for a reason, and that is because 20x allows us to image a large number of cells for a long period of time before phototoxicity starts damaging the cells. However, as a result, uh, this uh, causes a lower resolution and weaker signal to noise ratio, especially at the top and bottom of the nuclei. This leads to a poor segmentation and could affect the quality of our data and analysis. We could have alternatively imaged in 100x to improve the resolution and image quality. However, we would have had a significantly smaller field of view and the increased laser power means that we could only image for an hour or two before phototoxicity sets in. And this is a classic imaging trade-off that needs to be made when imaging cells for a prolonged period. However, we believe it's possible to apply deep learning in order to resolve this trade-off and get the best of both worlds. And we call this deep learning model the transfer function. To start off, we collected training data for our model by imaging the same Laman B1 tagged cells in fixed medium at both 20x and 100x. This, this way we have the exact same nuclei imaged at both uh, resolutions and can use image registration in order to align the, the images perfectly in 3D. We use uh, these registered images as training data for a cycle generative adversarial network or CGAN which is a deep learning network designed to generate realistic looking images based on a given input. Here we are using the nucleus imaged in 20x as the input and the 100x image as the ground truth for the output. As a result, what the model is learning how the model is learning how to take the 20x image and generate an image that estimates how it would look in 100x as close to reality as possible. We also take steps to validate the model to ensure that this is the case, but I won't go into the details of the validation here. What is important is that now we are able to use this model and perform inference on our live imaging data to transform our original 20x images into 100x. 
And so as a result, we are able to get the best of both worlds from our imaging. We are able to image our colonies at 20x, which gives us a large field of view that we can film for 48 hours. And by applying the transfer function, we also get the higher resolution and signal to noise ratio that we would get if we had imaged in 100x. This means that the segmentations generated from these images will be more accurate and we will be able to draw better conclusions from the resulting data. In order to get quality segmentations for, for each nucleus, we employed a two-step approach. First, we performed semantic segmentation using a model trained with the Allen cell structure segmenter. By semantic segmentation, I mean that we just separated the nuclei from the background of the field of view without distinguishing individual nuclei from each other. This allows us to get very accurate segmentations of the lamin shell. However, it leads to issues like this, where several nuclei are very close to each other and form a single object in the segmentation. Without additional steps, we can't distinguish these nuclei apart. So we use a separate object detection model on the image in order to find the location of individual nuclei. And using these results, we can split any merged nuclei and create a segmentation of the image where each nucleus is marked as its own separate object. This will allow us to measure the features of each nucleus and track them independently over time. To track each nucleus over the course of the time lapse, we used an optimization algorithm called Earth Mover Distance to match nuclei together on a frame by frame basis. I won't go into the math of the algorithm here, but the basic explanation is that we are trying to pair nuclei from one frame to the next in a way that minimizes the total distances moved and the relative changes in volume for each nucleus. So if we are trying to find this orange nucleus on the left in the next frame, the algorithm considers all of the nuclei near its current position, trying to find the one with the closest location and volume. In this case, the correct answer is obvious but the algorithm solves for all of the nuclei in the image simultaneously, which allows for more accurate matching in cases where the correct answer might not be so obvious if you were only looking at one nucleus at a time without considering the rest of the surrounding nuclei. And once this matching has been done for each frame, we are able to track each nucleus for through the entirety of the time lapse and extract data on its morphology and behavior. Like I said in the beginning, we are dealing with a very large data set. And because of the number of frames and the deep learning models we are utilizing, even processing a single movie with this workflow is a time consuming process that can take several weeks. And if we do all this processing with the manual inputs, it would take even longer with the man hours and constant monitoring necessary for each step. Because of this, we have been making efforts to integrate our workflow with tools like Slurm, DVC, and SnakeMake to automate the entire data processing um, workflow. Our eventual goal is to create a fully automated workflow that we can provide the raw 20x images and it will perform all of the steps necessary for us to have analyzable data. I'll leave you off here with, the, once again, this visualization of our final tracking results for the first video we've processed. With this tracking, we can extract features such as, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, we can, with this tracking, we can extract features such as volume, growth rate and shape. And we are able to observe how they change over time, both for individual nuclei and the colony as a whole. And as Nivi will be telling you in a moment, we have already begun to gain interesting biological insights just from analyzing this one time lapse. Thank you, Philip. Hi, I'm uh, Nivedita, and I'm a scientist on asset development team at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. 
So now that we have this amazing data, which I will play right now. So now that we have this amazing data from our image analysis pipeline, we can explore temporal and spatial dynamics of nuclei during colony growth. We can uncover mechanisms underlying nuclear growth dynamics and how they relate to the cell cycle and explore how nuclear shape changes over time. Furthermore, we can perform normal mode analysis to identify natural nuclear shape fluctuations resulting from the resonance properties of nuclear membrane and how these change with the cell cycle. Additionally, we are able to analyze the lo locations of nuclei in colony and by bringing it together with agent-based modeling, we can uh, explore how colony dynamics affect nuclear growth and shape. So in this talk specifically, I will be focusing on nuclear growth and shape dynamics, particularly on questions like, how do HIPACs regulate nuclear growth during the cell cycle and explore mechanisms underlying nuclear growth dynamics? And how do we measure shape? How does nuclear shape change over time? And what aspects of nuclear shape should we look at? For exploring nuclear growth dynamics, we can start by plotting volume for all the drag nuclei. Now, when we do that, we get this plot, which has a lot of information, but to make sense of it, we need to filter it out. So the first step we did was to look at longer tracks. After filtering tracks to longer than 10 hours, we got 725 tracks, which we further filtered and validated to get 172 single, uh, about 172 full tracks. That is tracks of 172 individual nuclei being followed through the entire interface. So when we look at one of these track, we can, tracks, we can follow one nucleus growing over time as shown in this video and its corresponding volume plot. And here we can get the start and end of interface by identifying the first frame where we see lamin shell formation and the last frame where we see lamin shell breakdown. We also found this very interesting point in the volume trajectory, which we call inflection point, where the nuclear growth rate seems to change quite dramatically. However, we, when we look at the corresponding frames in the video, we do not see any obvious visual change. So what if this point is indicating a change in self cycle phase, maybe a startup S phase? But after looking at the cell cycle duration using our TAC PCNA line, we discovered that the inflection point actually occurs during G1. Now we can further explore what happens at this inflection point by asking the timing of when the inflection occurs during the trajectory and how the volume of nuclei change at this inflection point. So we can look at the distribution of duration between shell formation and inflection point for all 172 nuclei. And we found that this inflection point occurs consistently around 36 minutes from lamin shell formation. We can also plot nuclear volume at shell formation, inflection, and shell breakdown. And when we look at this nuclear size distribution, we found that coefficient of variation at, at inflection is lower than the coefficient of variation at shell formation, indicating a consistent nuclear size at inflection point. I had mentioned that the inflection point occurs at a dramatic change in growth rate uh, in, the, in that one nuclear trajectory. However, what happens when we look at all the trajectories and does this behavior stay consistent? So looking at the average of 172 trajectories plotted against normalized interface time, which is normalized duration between lamin shell formation and shell breakdown, we see that there's an early phase of very rapid growth where nuclear size increases 1.8 fold in size, followed by a much slower phase of late growth with slower gain of volume. Looking deeper into these growth phases, we found that these phases are quite distinctly regulated. During early growth phase, we see that the growth rate is negatively correlated with starting volume at shell formation, indicating that smaller nuclei grow faster than larger nuclei. However, if we look at the duration of growth between shell formation and inflection point, we see that there's hardly any correlation between duration and initial volume which means that small and large nuclei both grow for similar duration. We see the opposite behavior in the late growth phase where smaller nuclei are growing for a longer period of time as compared to larger nuclei, but they both are growing at a similar rate. Now this 
late growth phase looks very linear. But is it le really linear? And can we explore mechanisms underlying this growth phase by using some toy models? So for example, if DNA replication is regulating this growth phase, then a linear model should fit because DNA volume increases linearly with time and the growth rate is constant. If protein synthesis is regulating growth phase, then we can use an exponential model. So it is known that ribosomes are both made of protein and synthesized protein. So the growth rate will be proportional to volume, which uh, increases exponentially. Now, if the growth rate is dependent on the nuclear transport, assuming there is constant nuclear pore density, growth rate will be proportional to surface area. Assuming that surface area has a constant relationship with volume over time, we can fit our surface area and volume data to obtain our constant K, which is 3 fourth. So the parameters to note here are K, which is a proportionality constant, and V0 that defines initial volume. Initial volume is particularly important as it sets the value for volume throughout the nuclear growth trajectory. Now, when we fit our models to our analysis data, we can look at the residuals for fit at V0. Residual is the difference between our observed V0 and fit at V0. Linear model underestimates the mean at V0 and exponential model gives us uh, an opposite case and overestimates, although the distribution is a bit more symmetric. And the surface area and nuclear transport based model seems to be the closest fit. We can also look at the residuals over the course of normalized interface time. And we see that all the three models, uh, although all the three models are quite similar, but if we zoom in, we can see how they differ. They are still quite close in the range of plus uh, to plus four to minus four uh, micrometer cube, although surface area based model is still the closest fit. But because there are systematic errors in the model propagated throughout through the normalized interface time, we might need to refine this a bit further by specifically considering how surface area and volume relationship changes over the course of nuclear trajectory, especially because especially because nuclei flatten and elongate as they grow. And therefore it's important to look into how shape changes when we are considering the model. Now that we have an initial indication that surface area uh, could be regulating growth, could it also inform us about inflection point? Here I'm showing snapshots from a video of uh, histone H2B GFP fusion image at three minute intervals to observe chromosome dynamics in live HIPACs. Prior to lamin shell formation indicated by A here, we see distinct chromosome shapes, which begin dissipating as we enter early growth phase. From this, we can surmise that chromosomes decondense during the early growth phase and DNA fills this nuclear envelope like quickly filling an empty wrinkly balloon. But at some point, the pressure from DNA growth equilibrates with surface tension of the nuclear envelope which could cause slowdown in nuclear growth, and then this growth could be regulated by the surface area. So this is just a mechanistic initial speculation that we have to think about how surface area could be regulating nuclear growth. Till now, uh, I've been talking about the analysis which has been focused around nuclear volume. However, there are multiple features that we can extract from our amazing data. Volume is only one aspect of the nuclear shape that we can look at. Let's take a step, step back and see how we can measure nuclear shape and see how that changes over time. We can use spherical harmonics to parameterize nuclear shape, following which we can use principal component analysis to identify aspects of nuclear shape that account for most variation. Here I'm, uh, here you can see eight major what we call shape modes that account for most variation. We see height and size shown in side and top view that account for 70% of variation in nuclear shape, followed by elongation and tilt along minor and major axes, followed by shape modes that represent the curvature of the nucleus, which we are calling beanness, pairness, and diamondness. We can also see how these shape modes change over time by colorizing the video of the colony by value of the shape modes. And these videos give us insight into the time dynamics of these shape modes. 
For example, in case of elongation, elongation is changing very rapidly over the course of few minutes, as is evident from all the flickering of colors that you see. And this could be due to neighbor effects where nuclei are bumping and bouncing off of each other. We see something different in case of size, where the nuclear size is changing as expected on the time scale of cell cycle. Now, in case of height, we see something very interesting, where we not only see a change in time scale, but we also see a change in spatial pattern. Where in, in the beginning, you can see these red taller nuclei, but as the colony grows, we see a lake of blue shorter nuclei rise in the center of the colony in the form of a lake. So, Height is changing on the time scale of colony dynamics, that is days. For us, all of this, all of this data particularly highlights the importance of considering different aspects of nuclear shape in our future analysis, which brings me to our next steps. In addition to what we've talked about today, we are also working on understanding how colony size affects nuclear growth and shape dynamics by analyzing the colonies of different sizes. We are also looking at uh, dual line, lamin and H2B to understand the chromatin behavior during mitosis and cell cycle. As mentioned before, we are also performing normal mode an analysis to identify natural nuclear shape fluctuations and how that relates to changes in cell cycle. And we are also looking into agent-based modeling to identify the simplest model needed to recapitulate the behavior observed in our cells. So for now, thank you for your attention and the opportunity to share our work with you. I have presented this work on the behalf of everyone at Allen Institute for Cell Science who have worked on this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nivi. And uh, before that, Philip, that was absolutely wonderful. We have some time for some questions. One, um, while we're waiting for some other questions to populate, um, I think one logical question might be, um, how do we anticipate that these studies approaches will translate to other cell types? So when it comes to the initial steps, so like the image acquisition, the transfer function and the segmentation, up until the semantic segmentation step, I think that for most uh, um, structures, it would remain the same. But when we get to things like the instance segmentation or, and tracking, that beca could become more challenging for things that are have less of a consistent um, uniform shape like nuclei do. And in that case, we might have to dual image the cells with something like um the nucleus so that we have some sort of like easier structure to do the tracking steps on and then be able to use those results to then distinguish the you know other structures okay um we have some questions from abby buchwalter uh beautiful work abby says um, Abby wonders how nuclear morphology would respond to the early stages of the epithelial mesenchymal transition, um, another focus of the Allen Institute, and the dramatic cytoskeletal rearrangements that, that the team is seeing in that project, um, and is specifically thinking about cytoskeletal, cytoskeleton induced forces on nuclei as EMT is underway. And that is a very interesting question because that is something that we are focusing on uh, in our analysis for uh, early EMT movies. And uh, hopefully we'll have some data for you in a bit where we can talk about how nuclear shape mode, if there are any changes uh, in the nuclear shape as uh, there is, as the cell is transitioning from epithelial to mesenchymal. And uh, during this transition, how the nuclear shape varies in early EMT transition and also in later uh, stages where uh, th there are uh, the cells are more motile. And uh, 
yeah, that is something that we are definitely looking into. It's a great question. And uh, another question from Timothy Fessenden on that perhaps related theme is, would these analytical tools be usefully applied to questions about nuclear deformations or potentially damage as cells traverse constrained or dense three-dimensional environments? Yes, that could possibly be uh, actually a great application of this because we are also applying uh, and, and trying to understand uh, both uh, not only how major shape modes change, which are part of variation, but we're also trying to understand in normal mode analysis how natural shape uh, fluctuations of an elastic membrane, which the nucleus is, how that is changing and uh, how that is uh, uh, affecting different uh, shape variations. So together with that, definitely how um, when the cells are traversing a three-dimensional medium or kind of whatever mechanical pressure it's feeling, or if there is any effect of uh, additional drug dose on uh, the nucleus, how that would uh, affect change in shape, that would definitely be future applications of uh, this work. Okay, wonderful. Um, I think we have a couple of more questions. Uh, we're going to move on in the interest of time, but if we could get back to those with written responses, that would really be great. So thank you both very much, Philly, Philip and Nivi. Um, and um, it is um, it's a little bittersweet for me to announce that our session has come to a close, but it was a wonderful session. Um, and uh, we're going to finish it off with a forum panel. And um, that panel is going to be moderated by my trusted, valued colleague, Kyle Klein. Uh, also a fellow symposium uh, organizer committee co-chair. And um, we're going to ask members of, um, we're going to ask speakers from this session today to turn their uh, screen back on and join us in that discussion. And we're going to have some questions that have been crafted uh, by members of our organization team. Uh, and these are going to deal with uh, our speakers' interests in and challenges within and um, also uh, some other questions that are going to deal with the future of the field of cell biology. And so uh, I'm really excited about this. I'm happy to turn it over to Kyle now and I hope you uh, enjoyed today's discussion and thank you all very much one more time. Great. Thanks very much, Brock. So my name is Kyle Klein and I'm a scientist on the stem cells and gene editing team here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. So welcome to the panel. Um, so I'll have specific questions for each panelist, but of course, discussion between all panelists is certainly encouraged. So let's start with a question for everyone. Um, so the, the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution has fundamentally changed the way we think about cell science. So what do you think will be the next revolution in cell science? So let's start with uh, David. Oh my goodness. Uh, so I've drawn pictures of Ca <laughs> Cas9, but <laughs> that's about it. Uh, in in my, my own field of modeling, I think just continued methods for communication is going to be the, the thing that's going to change everything. Uh, just continuing to, as Graham said, democratize. Um, I, I still have trouble finding the information that I need. So um, yeah. Great. Let's go next to Sonia. I would guess um, we would all love to see CRISPR more in action and, you know, kind of thinking about the ethics um, background it has and kind of how to, with that in mind, apply it to medical problems. I think that's going to be a big one. And I I mean, then when I think about my field, um, you know, which is novel genomics, tech dev tools, um, I think we have been so far good at incorporating what's going on in the cell now, but we've been bad incorporating what the cell has been doing and able to predict what it's going to do. Um, and I think CRISPR could be a part of that answer um if you know we think about new tools um that's kind of point number two and i would guess point number three might be that um 
which is a big one for me is that we have been relying on short tree the lumina sequencing for a long time um can we get any you know closer to having a protein sequencer great um sheila your thoughts yeah um i think that the i think that the word uh that David said was democratization. And I so I think that the the idea of like democratizing like these tools that are um you know sort of like in sort of proof of concept stage um or not necessarily uh widely available. Um I think that sort of needs to happen for there to be a massive shift. Like right. So you know for example, you know it wouldn't have been so world changing if CRISPR couldn't be done by uh, many, many labs, right? Um, and so I think in the realm of uh, statistics, machine learning, um, uh, sort of the democratization of deep learning tools um, will be a big shift. Um, especially things like these sort of gen generated adversarial networks, right? Like, you know, we, we saw in the previous um, talks about upscaling the, the resolution so that you can now have this sort of synthetic data that is so close. Um, I, I found that really, really cool. So yeah, democratization is the word. Excellent. Uh, next we'll go to Zabina. Um, okay, so not to repeat what, what everybody else had said. So, um, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, a big direction is still to figure out with all these automated methods, genomics, proteomics, and all of this data, what do we actually make out of it? And that's kind of the, the bottom, you know, well, I guess a top-down approach. And then at the same time, we have, you know, protein biochemists, um, where I call myself uh, belong to this group where we, you know, used to study individual molecules, but we really have to start looking at molecular systems and build things bottom up. And so I do think these two approaches really have to meet one another. So I do think there's a lot of room in the next decades, if not this next century to actually make that happen. Um, and then we can see that also on the, on the method side, right? So we also have a merging of light microscopy and it is, has a resolution limit of, of nanometers and electron microscopy methods where you can now reach uh, atomic resolution. And I think it will be much more easier for biologists to actually also use electron microscopy methods to actually resolve atoms of whatever they want to look at. And I do think a big new direction will be to actually now make also, you know, these um, you know, atomic resolution levels fast, right? So, uh, you know, electron microscopy is very static. You just get a snapshot. But I think that would be a big new direction where I think if we can still get that temporal resolution, uh, I think that's something that we should somehow work toward. And then, um, you know, I do think it's a pretty exciting time too, because, uh, you know, it's um, has never been so easy to work together across the globe. And I think it's actually partly thanks to this pandemic. So I think if there's maybe something a little good that came out of it is that scientists have started to connect more, uh, you know, via, via Zoom and so on, like this meeting can happen virtually. And really, I think if there's anybody in the world you want to work together with, it's, it's possible now. And, um, and also if you have a sample that needs to be collected on an expensive instrument that's on another continent, you can send those samples. So I think it is actually also an amazing time really to, to, to work together. Uh, and so, um, you know, while I can't really pinpoint and say this will be the new discovery, uh, you know, I just wanna put this out to this young generation that may be listening that, um, you know, th there's still so much unknown. And I think this is really a fantastic time to become a scientist. And, you know, you started out by asking, okay, okay, now we had CRISPR. Like if you think about the RNA revolution and what it brought, it brought CRISPR, it brought mRNA vaccines. You know, now a big discovery, I think was really these phase transitions. And so I think it will be really exciting to watch, um, you know, what, what will be found next. And I hope that the young people will be inspired to really take this on. And I think that also, like, this is in the end what excites me about science that, you know, we actually don't really know. And um, you know, any one of us could make that discovery. Yeah, absolutely. And coming to Matt last. The two things come to mind for me. One is um, related to what Sabina said um, about how we can understand the structure, function, relationship of protein complexes in context of an intact cell. And so this seems like fulfilling the vision of what David Goodsell and Graham Johnson mentioned. Um, I think because of cryo-electron tomography, 
we don't have to guess anymore what the architecture or molecular structure is of a particular protein complex. And you can average multiple complexes to get a higher resolution structure. And then we started running simulations based on those architectures to see what the consequences are from a mechanics point of view um, of a particular, let's say, organization of actin filaments in the context of a particular site in the cell. And I think we'll need um, multi-scale modeling, which Dow Institute is, is really helping to democratize. Um, so we have atomic level simulations that the input output relationships connect to the higher, the more coarse grained simulations like Joe mentioned yesterday. And the other thing I'm excited about is figuring out the role of heterogeneity in uh, cell biological processes. Um, how is the cell harnessing heterogeneity to carry out its purposes? Is it a feature rather than a bug? Um, I think you know Brownian and ratchets are a great example of um, how heterogeneous, heterogeneous populations lead to directional force production. Um, Lucas's talk, I think, was another um, really inspiring example of trying to wrap our heads around um, why, why things in the cell are so heterogeneous. Great. Thanks, everyone, for the comments there. So this next question, more focused on career development, and particularly for early stage PIs, uh, ask um, Sheila, as an early stage PI, how do you find a niche for your research and make it stand out in the field? Yes, um, thanks for that question. I am minus three months into my <laughs> PI. Very early. Um, so uh, I, I, these are these are more aspirations than uh, experiences, I guess. Um, yeah, like I think that finding kind of like new new areas and uh, sort of gaps. Um, it seems to me like I, you, you sort of pay attention to uh, times when you're kind of forced to uh, go down a particular analysis path. Like you sort of realize that, uh, you know, this might not be the best option, but it's all we've got. Um, you know, for example, uh, this sort of question of data integration, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could use extra information? What, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to throw away other information? And then you, you sort of start to think it's like, well, maybe you can generate that possibility um, and, and you sort of start to like think and, and, and so on. So um, uh, it does seem to me like finding these uh, sort of niches of, of research does come about from sort of recognizing when you're potentially not using the data in the most optimal way or like, you know, you're sort of uh, recognizing that you could do a bit better but you're not sure, quite sure how. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a better answer soon. All right. Uh, how about our other early stage PIs, Matt or Sanya? Anything to add? Um, my angle has been, from a methods point of view, to try to split my time between modeling and experiments. Um, so I was in a graduate program that brought together physicists, engineers, and biologists to try to learn how to talk to each other. So I sort of gradually shifted from cell biology to doing splitting my time 50-50. So then if I have a question about how everything in or the particular components in, in my field work together, I try to set up a model and run a simulation. Um, and it usually clarifies my questions I didn't even realize I was supposed to be asking. Um, and then I run the simulation and that that doesn't fit my mental model either. Model either. So then it's... it's um, sends the research off in a, in a new direction. Great. Sonia, anything more? Yeah, so I I just kind of like to add one thing. Um, so, you know, you, you, you become a young PI and you get a lot of different um, advice from a lot of either, you know, friends or senior faculty members and a lot of them evolve around. Uh, pick a focus area. Um, I would say, okay, sure, I'll pick one. Uh, but I want to ask the hard question and I don't want to, you know, be scared that, you know, I won't have funding in three years. So that's the, the, the worst part about starting your own lab is like this, 
not having or not being able to provide for your group more long term right than the initial three years so I don't know I I right now I I think you know risk it try to try to contribute to to answer that that hard question and you know don't go necessarily with the stream of of everyone else um yeah that that's kind of my my piece of advice but again you know might not be for everyone to take that risk great yeah got to make yourself stand out somehow um, so a question for our more established PIs, um, when you're looking to hire people for your lab, um, what, what aspects, what characteristics are you looking for and how has that changed from a, from your early career into your, uh, later career? Let's start with David. Oh, it's been pretty much the same. And, you know, I, I'm always looking for people that, that have a real passion for science. You can always learn techniques, right? But you need to have somebody who would be doing science even if they weren't being paid for it, you know? Um, and everything just builds from that. Great. Sabina? Yeah, I think you're still muted. Sorry, oh, I would echo that. Uh, I think the most important thing is, uh, you know, the motivation and the passion. Um, Obviously, I do think, you know, like I think intelligent and talented. Um, and, um, and I think it's also quite important, to, uh, you know, to, to be willing to switch fields. Um, you know, I, I do think most of the people who joined my lab actually did not come from the same field and they actually changed fields pretty drastically. Like we also have engineers and physicists and theorists in the lab. Um, and I do think it usually, you know, it takes longer to retrain, but I do think in the long run it pays off. And I think it also pays off then for the trainee you know, it circles back to the other question, you want to start your own lab by doing a big switch between PhD and postdoc, you actually become really unique. And so I think then that makes it actually easy to, to set up your own research program because nobody has the expertise that you have if you actually combine two different fields. And then I also pay attention to that it's it's a good person. There I just have a feeling that you know the, it's, it's like you know, a nice, a good human being that can work well as a team. And I think that's probably what I'm most proud of for my lab, that I think they're actually working incredibly well together and they help each other. Um, right. And so I would say kind of, it's almost these soft skills and kind of this, you know, intrinsic motivation uh, that I think is the driver for everything. And it's more important that the, the actual technical skills they bring, because I think if you're smart and motivated, you can learn anything. Right. And, and to follow up on that, how do you maintain relationships, good relationships with the people that eventually transition out of your lab into, you know, new areas of study, or maybe even very similar areas of study to what you've been working on? That's a good question. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Um, being proud <laughs> that they're <laughs> carrying on and doing their work better than, than I ever did. I think that's a big thing. Um, but, you know, so in some respects, you have to kick them out of the nest, right? <laughs> <laughs> let them fly on their own so you're not, so they're not under your thumb anymore. I think that that's a big, big step of that is, is, a, a, is building a career that has your own unique stamp on it. And so I, I kind of try to stay out of the picture as much as I can, send opportunities if I can, but, but not, not be an advisor anymore. I see. Any other thoughts on that, Savina? Um, I, I like that phrase, you have to kick them out of the nest, right? And I think it is almost like, you know, when you're a parent, I do think there's something about, you know, it's, it's painful to let somebody go, right? Uh, but you have to do it for their own good, you know? <laughs> so, so I do think there's something about, you know, also our job to really facilitate that transition, uh, like to really mentor when it is time and, and to give them the tools and the means that makes it possible for them to be successful too. Uh, but at the same time, I also want to point out that there are, you know, different stages where that is probably easier than others. Um, you know, I do think, especially if, you know, when you're starting your lab, um, obviously the, the PI, the young PI is still starting their research program up. So, you know, I think there is a little bit of a challenge if somebody then leaves the lab and wants to stay very close to the direction of the lab. 
But then I would also say maybe it's not good for the trainee to try to do that because they also want to diversify, should diversify a little bit more. Whereas let's say a more senior PI, and I don't think I've reached that level yet, uh, you know, who has already made the career, you know, can probably be more generous in like saying, just take this and, you know, go off and do this. So I think there are different phases, um, but I think no matter what, I do think it's also in the interest of the trainee to really try to come up with their own unique research program and thereby research brand. And so, um, you know, I do think often obviously it works best if, you know, there is like a you know a mutual support so to say you know but I have to say I mean it is I think it's a delicate balance and um, you know I don't think there's something like you know a, a hard rule that you can write out because also the cases are so individual of course great um, so moving on to our next question so what is your white whale result some a result that you know kind of has to be out there but you don't have the, the tools or the time to actually get at that quite yet. Uh, let's go to Sonia first. Um, I have to admit, I haven't really thought about that one. Um, no, so you're, you're gonna have to uh, put someone else in the spot, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, um, anyone else have something that comes right to their mind? So I've been working on bacterial systems for the past couple of years and everything that I saw here at this, at this symposium is, is by white whale. These systems are so huge and diverse and complicated. And um, I mean, there's so many details that would need to be filled in for us to start building models or even, even doing effective illustrations of this. And so uh, I'm excited to, to jump in, but it's so daunting, you know? Yeah, that transition from prokaryote to eukaryote, I'm sure must be huge. Yeah, and we're doing it in bits and pieces. We're gonna jump into mitochondria next, you know? <laughs> Very exciting. Anyone else want to share their white whale? I mean, I, I would have an example that I actually now, I think was an interesting question. And I think I'm bringing up an old one. So as a PhD student, I worked on the structure of the ribosome and actually I had to figure out how the termination of translation works. And uh, there is uh, the eukaryotic release factor that at that time, and again, not revealing my age here, but this was maybe like 15 years ago, um, the eukaryotic release factor that recognizes stop conons was known to also make aggregates. And to me as a structural model, that, that seems super strange. Like they have, you know, this important protein that can go from this folded form to something else, uh, yet it has to work all the time in the cell. Uh, and uh, it kept on, it was on the top of my mind, but I feel like I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the tool and, and, and the, the spread to even target this. Um, but now 15 years later, you know, I, I think I just saw a paper where that aggregated form of, of this release factor was also characterized as a phase transition and where it has an important, you know, regulatory role for the cell. And so I, you know, I just want to use that as an example that whatever you encounter, and this is also a reminder for myself, whatever you encounter, you think that's kind of weird and nobody else is working on, I think would be a fantastic start for a research project, if not a research program. So I think if you think something is weird, uh, follow it up and there's usually something to it. Yeah. Weird is interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. So for me, um, I turned to the, the, the Paul Allen question of what is the operating system of the cell? Um, what are the principles that non-living components are using to get together to make a living thing? Um, and so from a sort of uh, organizational and structural point of view, are they behaving like a well-controlled system? Like let's say like a, a finely tuned watch where everything's sort of happening in synchrony. Are they behaving more like a grassroots organization where there's lots of chaos, but somehow they, they get something done uh, anyway? Um, and so incorporating things like study of complex systems, um, agent-based models, um, seems like we'll have to depart from our like linear stepwise thinking that we use like in classical physics or in like cartoon diagrams to, to eventually explain what's different between cellular life and, and non-life. And also has, has gotten me more and more into being convinced that I have to collaborate with as many people as possible, because I think there's no way that one lab can address such a big question. Great, thanks very much. Any other thoughts, any other whales out there? 
If not, we'll move on to the next question here. We'll go to uh, Sheila first. How do you think the scientific community as a whole can build more trust with the public? Mm. I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, and uh, I guess there's various strategies that sort of we can take as individuals um, when we're sort of communicating our science, I guess. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's always possible to explain what it is that you're doing without using fancy terminology or without using big jargon. It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of thinking to get to that. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of like, you know, developing your, not your elevator pitch, but like your, you know, explain to uh, anyone who may have a different background to you. Um, and I think having that kind of uh, way of explaining what it is that you do uh, kind of automatically brings people on board um, people who don't um, necessarily have the same uh, scientific background as you. Um, I think that's, you know, just taking an afternoon, maybe a whole day to, to try to think about what it is that you do um, and how to explain it. Great. Any more to add? I can just say that from, from my experience with the PDB and outreach there is, it's really important to, to not try to be all things for all people, you know? Uh, so at the PDB, the work that I do, I think about it as nibbling away the edges of the community that, that can use the PDB and understand structural science. I'm not trying to teach everybody in the world what a ribosome is. Um, but so again, the goal is very targeted to just increasing the audience sequentially mm. around there. Uh, 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 yeah. So you need different different modes for different audiences. You know, it's not the same as the Nova audience. Customized approach, yes. Zabina? I'm not sure you kind of also just want to add, I, I do think that, you know, outreach is so important. I do think sometimes, you know, individual outreach can, you know, I feel like it feels sometimes very incremental, right? And there may be few, very few people that show up. But obviously, it's personal. I would hope that again, because of this pandemic, with you know all the bad things it brought, um, I would hope that a new generation of scientists is inspired. Because in the end, I think science really saved us here. So I would hope that every every small kid now wants to be a biologist. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, having uh, really these worldwide public events can be helpful. Um, uh, I do think it would also be great if the media could just depict scientists and science more positively. Um, I have read, and this is not based on experience, but I have read that, for example, in Asia, like scientists are really more regarded as superheroes. And so I think just a cultural image, a positive image as a scientist, as a superhero, I think would be fantastic. Uh, and I hope maybe other, other continents can kind of also try, try to do that. Um, but I also think then, you know, people actually like David Goodsell are really great examples of how maybe outreach can happen to, you know, almost like the, the uh, venue of art, right? Because I mean, your, your pictures, I mean, they're beautiful pieces of art. Um, I'm sure you must have had exhibitions. I think if there's an exhibition, I could see where the public would come and they would be inspired by this too. Um, you know, I have another, um, you know, science friend, Ellen Drummond from the University of Chicago. He actually makes um, beautiful drawings and he makes kind of a, a box um, out of, uh, he makes jewelry almost with them and he had his own, his own ex exhibition. So I think there can actually be quite a bit of reach if we can get into these other areas. And, um, you know, I'm kind of also excited to see it uh, maybe in, in children's shows a little bit more. Uh, for example, there's this children's show, of, I think it's called um, Ada the Scientist, I may not recall it properly, but, uh, you know, that's amazing because it's a little girl who's the scientist. And so I feel like I never had a scientist show going up. So I'm really excited about it and also that it's a little girl. And um, they actually also had uh, real life scientists in there. And actually, as I talk about it, also know that the Big Bang Theory, uh, theory had uh, Francis Arnold in there. So I do think that, you know, actually through these popular shows, I think there are really ways to make sci science at least um, be, you know, on, like in the picture of everyday life. And so I hope that a little bit more will be happening there. But maybe that can also be an inspiration for us scientists 
uh, to try to push toward these broader channels, uh, ch channels and take those opportunities up if they come toward us. Great, thanks very much. Um, so on to our last question here. So um, what does a healthy scientific community look like to you and what areas need the most improvement? Let's uh, start with Sonia. Um, I think um, open communication is key. Um, I think it's also, um, you know, sometimes uh, a lot of people think it's, it's hard and they don't want to talk about their results because they don't want to get scooped. Um, but I think we sometimes forget we're doing this to help forward science and not only to get the next grant. And I think it's, it's hard to think that way, but I think we should do a better job at, at sharing, sharing our thoughts on science and our results and, you know, collaborating openly, um, not just on paper or, or because of someone needs a letter of support. Um, so I think we need to work on that one quite a bit. Um, I agree with what Sabina said about, you know, when you recruit people, you, you look, you know, that they're good people. Um, and I think that's something I hope in my lab is the case as well. Great. Any further thoughts on that? For sure, this, this uh, concept of sharing, I think, is at the center of, of everything, um, as you said, Sanjay. And looking back to um, the protein structure, uh, the, the way things changed was both with a carrot and a stick. Uh, one is providing the protein data bank as a way for people to share their stuff and get it out and you know, have in instantly and multiple people were using the, the stuff. But at the same time, a stick from the journals saying, you have to deposit it or we're not gonna publish your paper in nature. And that got the last recalcitrant people to, to start depositing their data. That process is still happening in terms of these more mesoscale um, level things, in part because we don't really have wonderful databases like that, like the PDB to deposit our stuff. But I mean, going forward as those databases become more and more available. Um, I think we're gonna need both that, the carrot and the stick to, to make sure that people make their stuff available. You know, if I can add on, I mean, I, I fully agree that it's so important to, you know, share the agents and techniques and so on. I think it would be nice if there was something like a scientific honor code that, um, that everybody could almost like assign and you know, maybe there could be something like some organization, maybe even the Allen Institute can start this, I'm thinking of like the United Nations of Scientists or something like that, but where everybody who signs would pledge to a set of principles that would include, let's say, open communication, respect toward each other, do not discriminate based on you know, anything, um, and uh, you know, share reagents. And, and basically, I think once that would be started, I wonder if that would be kind of snowball system where if you almost don't sign it and don't join the organization, it would look bad on you. Like it would also be like a little bit of a peer pressure. Um, but I think that could be nice because I think even though we all agree and we have thoughts for, of what we need to have a good scientific community, it is not organized. And so I feel like something like ethics principles that everyone agrees on, I think what could be a really nice, uh, nice way to kind of foster that a little bit more. Go ahead, Matt. And so I'm also thinking about how to foster community over competition. And the one time in which I saw this shift happen was during COVID when we said, okay, our favorite cell biology process X, how is it modified by SARS-CoV-2 non-structural protein, whatever. And so we made the big multilateral collaboration um, among several labs just to collect the data and see if we could contribute to global understanding of COVID. So then we were competing against COVID, not against each other. And um, it'd be really nice to see, you know, if, if there are big scientific questions that we're trying to all get to, um, how to make it, keep aligning it towards the collective effort. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about is how to make sure that people's work is recognized and rewarded in proportion to the amount of work that they did, um, which is why I'm really excited about the possibility of doing 
of publishing more micro publications where one single result um, has an author list uh, and contributes to a larger story. But I wonder if this could incentivize collaborative work because you have a number of people each with their own micro publication that works towards uh, a larger story and they're still, they'll still get cited, they'll still get tracked um, rather than worrying that your collaborative effort relegates you to a position on an authorship list that isn't good for your career, et cetera. Oh, very interesting. Um, if I could add one component as well, I think we saw sure. this during the sort of start of the pandemic was um, the massive increase in preprints. Um, just like that sheer shift in the amount of time uh, between, uh, you know, the, the, the writing of the manuscript and the acceptance in the journal, like that can be years. Um, but uh, just having, you know, these principles of open science and um, you know, open source and open data, you know, it comes about with uh, placing uh, preprints up. More for it. Great. I think we'll go ahead and close the panel then. Uh, thank you to all our speakers for your excellent presentations and engaging discussion here. Uh, thanks everyone again for joining the Se Seattle Cell Science Symposium and for your thoughtful questions. So this concludes the webinar for today. Again, thanks everyone and to all the teammates at the uh, Allen Institute for Cell Science. And of course, to our founder, Paul G. Allen for his vision encouragement and support. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day.